C'est un plaisir de vous recevoir ici au CESE, au Comité, Comité économique et social européen. Donc euh, je pense que les personnes qui sont dehors vont doucement commencer à rentrer. Euh, C'est sympa de voir une salle presque pleine. Je peux inviter les personnes qui sont assises derrière à venir s'installer derrière nous ici. Hein. Vous aurez également l'interprétation. C'est donc une session qui va se passer en trois langues, en français, en espagnol et en anglais. Donc vous avez accès à l'interprétation avec vos casques. Vous pouvez changer les langues sur le petit boîtier qui est en face de vous. Donc ceux qui sont au fond là-bas, celles et ceux qui sont au fond n'ont pas accès à l'interprétation. Bienvenue à celles et ceux qui sont en ligne également. Bon, je ne les vois pas, mais j'imagine qu'elles sont par ici. Euh, donc, je propose qu'on ouvre euh, cette, cette réunion, euh, cet événement organisé par ECVC, la Coordination européenne via Campesina, euh, pour avoir plus de fermes en Union européenne, en Europe, une feuille de route pour la reterritorialisation des systèmes alimentaires européens. Euh, donc, je vais faciliter cette discussion. Je m'appelle Emma Courtine et je suis membre de l'équipe de CVC basée ici à Bruxelles. Et sans plus attendre, je vais donner la parole à M. Peter Schmitt. Yeah, thank you very much, Carmen. So, are you ready? Oui, 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 à vous. I'm ready as well. Uh, yeah, thanks, um, uh, Carmen, and uh, thanks, uh, Via Campesina, um, and colleagues here in the, in, in the room. Welcome you all to this joint event, uh, which is uh, co-organized uh, uh, between the ESC and, uh, and the, the different organizations. So, I have a special welcome to our uh, Commissioner for Agriculture, um, Janusz Wojciechowski is uh, very, very much appreciate that you could make it to come here today to discuss with the farmers um, the future of the farmers, uh, to discuss what is to be done uh, in order to uh, make the farmers' world um, a world which will survive also in the next 10. C'est ne marche pas? En français. Je dois, je dois changer en français. Benoît, pour toi, peut-être. <laughs> OK, so um, normally I have not the cabins behind me, so I look at the cabins. So can we fix the problem? Because that makes, brings our time management into huge trouble if I have to do the two languages, not only because of the timing, also my French is not that... Uh, <laughs> that I could uh, could manage it. So it, it does uh, give me an indication that you know I have to bridge the situation. It's it's working now, good. So it's always then. Uh, um, yeah. So we want to discuss with you today. Uh, I'm happy that you could make it um, for us here to discuss with those farmers, farmers, farmers issue. So, but give me the chance to tell you a couple of words to the to the to the ESC. Not everyone is familiar. Um, with this house. This is, a, this is the house of the organized civil society. So we have 329 members composed in three groups. We have group one, that's the employers group. Group two is the group of the trade unions. And group three is the group of the uh, civil society organizations. And what we are doing is we organize our work and we come, and that's the power of this house, we come to joint positions. And some in the room here um, are members currently, and some of them were members in the past. For instance, Andoni and uh, Genevieve, uh, they worked very hard um, on, on, uh, on the subject to get a um, different view on agriculture rather than we had over decades through the common agriculture policy and we produced a lot of papers. I realize you're not on the video. <clears throat> yeah, but um, this is done by purpose, otherwise I must look at myself and this is not what I like, you know. It's sufficient. If I stand up in the morning, have the mirror in front of me, that's the only view what I would like to have it. So that's why, don't worry, I'm happy not to, to look at myself, so I'm happy to look in the nice, into the nice faces. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. I don't want to stress your time too much and too long because we want to listen to the commissioner and I would like to listen to you 
um, <clears throat> to discuss and happy to hear from your side, uh, your organized and directive, for instance. So I've, I'm sure that we will hear a bit more as long as uh, the commissioner is here because there are, there, there are important points in it which have to be discussed um, uh, jointly here in this, uh, uh, in this house. But I was still on the, on, the, on the side to describe what the ESC is about. And the ESC, I can tell you, is, uh, is, um, is on your side. If you look into opinions, then you see that we called as the first institution for a comprehensive food policy uh, in Europe, which is now the farm to fork strategy. So, and in this opinion 2016, we said, what we need is we must have a holistic approach in the food production, not only on the agricultural side, but in the food production from the farm indeed uh, to, to the fork. So that's why the ESC is very committed for an, for an system change in the, in, the food, in the food policy. And um, apologize that I always say food policy. I know that you are farmers, uh, most of you, but I think we must really see that the holistic approach across the food supply chain is the necessary view because otherwise we make the mistakes of the past that we just have a look in agriculture. Uh, purely. And that's not the way how we can proceed. The way how, how we must proceed is that we take all the positions of the different stakeholders uh, into account, coming to the targets of the farm to fork, which is absolutely clear that we are fully behind these targets because we already discussed it. But, and now it comes to but, we have backtrackers. We have a lot of people, a lot of organizations, a lot of groups, they, they don't like this system change. And they are now fighting in order to go back and keep the situation as it is now. And what we have to do is we have to tell them there is no future with, a, with, a, with, the, with the old approach on <clears throat> agriculture. There is only a future for the agriculture if we really make a shift towards a sustainable solution. And to be crystal clear, the farmers are not the problem. The farmers are the solution. And this is we have to really stress every, every time when we are coming together to get rid of a negative picture, a negative image, uh, which, is, which is built by some, some of politicians, some of organizations. So targeting um, farmers, we have to clarify that it's not that we have to target people doing their job, that we get an every day on the table that what we need a couple of times per day, that means food. And it's not to give here a negative image. That's why I'm happy uh, to make the opening remarks here. We have the chance later on to discuss. Uh, I would like to, <clears throat> if you allow, Carmen, then I would like to yeah. hand over directly uh, to, um, uh, to the commissioner, uh, Mr. Wojciechowski. You have the floor now. Thank you very much. Ah, it's okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation. It is my great pleasure to be here, to, to have opportunity to meet you and to discuss uh, with you. But first of all, I'd like to... Uh, was Micro? Micro, uh, okay. Uh, this, maybe this one. <laughs> okay. Stereo. Yeah. It's not uh, want to see me. First of all, I'd like to uh, use this opportunity to say thank you Thank you very much for you, for the small European small farmers, for your huge contribution to ensure food security in the European Union uh, in this very difficult time. This uh, directive exactly three years ago started the uh, uh, coronavirus crisis, COVID-19 pandemic crisis, uh, with many consequences for our economy, including the food systems. And now, more than one year, we have also very difficult situation because of Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, also with uh, many consequences for our food system. And thanks to our farmers, uh, uh, we are secure from the point uh, in the uh, aspect of food. There is no lack of food in the European Union during the whole difficult time. And this is the huge contribution of the, our farmers. As first of all, the small 
and medium-sized family farmers. I'd like to say thank you very much for, for, for this contribution. <coughs> the European Union is uh, not, not only the, the, our farmers ensured not only the food security, but uh, European in, in European Union, but European Union is now the biggest food exporter in the world, and this is a very important contribution to uh, to uh, uh, ensure to, 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 to support the, the food security at the global level. Thank you very much uh, for, for this. For better understanding the role of the small farms in the, our food system, maybe it's important to, to, to remind uh, some figures that uh, the smallest farms, no more than two hectares, they, uh, uh, they have 12 percent of the farmland in the, at the global level, but they produce 35 percent of food. <coughs> this is not uh, my recommendation for the European Union to have the, such small farms, because uh, no, the situation is uh, 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 historically, and that's, uh, this is not recommended model, but this, it shows how important is role the small farms in, in the food system at the global level. And probably if this, 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 this area of the 12% of land should be take, would be taken from the small farmers and given to the big, large farms, we will not have this 35% of food, probably not 12% of food, less than 12% of food. Um, it shows how important is the role uh, the, the small farms. Uh, Last uh, week, I, I was in the United States. I had the opportunity to meet the many, many American farmers. Um, I participated in the Outlook Conference in the United States. Interesting experience, but also the opportunity to, co to compare the situation. Uh, uh, the structure of agriculture, we know Then in the United States, they have large-scale farming. Uh, average size of the farms is about the 190 hectares. 10 times more than European Union, more than 10 times, because the average size of the farm in European Union now is 17 and a half uh, hectares. Uh, they have two times more land, because the uh, agriculture area in European Union is about the 160 million hectares, in the US is uh, 320. But the production, where is bigger? In European Union because the, the value of the agricultural production, <coughs> this data from 2021, in dollars, that's uh, European Union, 433 billion dollars, United States, 370 uh, billion uh, dollars. Having uh, two times less land and having two times less farms, we produce in European Union more uh, more food than, than, than comparing to, to U.S. And also, if we analyze the statistic data from the, from the European Union, uh, also, the, I don't like to, 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 to uh, list the, the names of the countries, but the countries with the, the biggest area, the, the biggest average size of farms, they are not the leaders of the agricultural produce, pr uh, production. The leaders are countries with the small, or do dominated by the small and medium sized uh, farms. It shows that we should to take care about the small farmers in, in European Union. Uh, according to the last census data, Unfortunately, we lost 3 million farms during one decade, 2010-2020. The number of farms was decreased from 12 million to 9 million. Uh, and this is negative process. And uh, we should uh, to change our agricultural <coughs> policy to, to, to stop this process and to protect better small farms. I hope that the, the new reform common agriculture policy, which started uh, uh, 1st of January this year, uh, should be more uh, uh, supporting uh, small farmers than it was uh, in the past. 10% of the 
direct payment, uh, uh, the instrument which is the redistributive payment for the small farms. I think the eco schemes, 25% for eco schemes, many of them, they are uh, uh, I, they should be su supportive for, especially for the for the small farmers, and uh, I hope that uh, this policy will be better for the for the small scale farming than than in the past. Uh, but we should st start also the our thinking, our our debate about the future of the common agricultural policy after 27. We have the strategic plans, the, uh, the clear policy for the, this next five years, but now we should start the discussion what will be the future of the agriculture policy in the European Union uh, in the um, uh, period after 27. Uh, probably in autumn this, this year we will publish, the Euro European Commission will publish the first it will be communication on other type of documents. It was not uh, decided yet, but uh, the first vision of the common agricultural policy post-27. But I can declare that the strengthening of the small-scale farming will, will be one of the most important uh, 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 important part of this, this, this document. This, this future document to strengthen small scale farming. I fully understand the role of these this farms because this is not only the question of the agricultural production, this is also the question uh, of the sustainable development of our rural areas. And if the, we lose the farmers, we, we lose uh, also the population of the, of the rural areas. But the population, not sustainable development of these this areas is also the very negative, um, uh, have the negative, uh, many negative aspects and we need to um, also to use the synergy between uh, European policies to support uh, people living in rural areas, uh, including the, 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 the small farmers. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, <coughs> maybe this is for the, for the introduction. Maybe enough. I'm, I will stay with you um, about the one hour and uh, we can discuss if you have any questions uh, for me. Thank you again for the invitation. This is my pleasure to be here. My colleague from, from DG Agri will participate uh, during all your discussion. Uh, and uh, I'm very interested about the, your conclusions of your discussion, your recommendation. Thank you very much again for the invitation and uh, opportunity to participate in this event. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner, for being here and for this uh, kind opening words. Uh, we would like to continue with uh, a video that we recently made um, on our manifesto that I will, I will show you a copy of right now. Uh, so this is a manifesto for a farming a transition that <coughs> replies uh, to systemic climate crisis. Um, this manifesto was elaborated in November 2021, uh, 2022, sorry, <laughs> and it was uh, co-signed by other um, organizations that are also present here. So thank you uh, to you all for being here. Uh, we, I suggest uh, to start the video now. is to act. It is time for policymakers to act. As small and medium scale farmers from all over Europe, we produce healthy food on our farms. Every day we face the consequences of industrialized agriculture. From pollution and environmental destruction to unhealthy food, job losses and more. And of course, the climate crisis is hitting us hard too. Agriculture emits about 15% of greenhouse gases in the EU, but not all agriculture is alike. So, we created a manifesto to guide the EU towards agricultural transition to address systemic climate crises through 13 urgent and interconnected action points. 
Unlike large-scale farming, our agroecological models are sustainable, reduce carbon emissions, are more resilient and protect biodiversity. Our manifesto asks the European Union to implement policy to ensure a just and inclusive transition, as promised in the Green Deal. This means more farmers in the fields with a decent income and a ban on dangerous technologies. We demand more sustainable and fairer management of land and water and access to good food for all sectors of society. For real change, we need to rethink the whole system now. And it's the responsibility of the European Union to drive that change and build more sustainable food systems. Together with civil society organisations, we are offering concrete solutions to the climate crisis. If the European Union is ready to challenge the status quo and implement our 13 action points towards food sovereignty, then, then together, together we, we can, can make, make a change. change. Together, together we can make a change. We can make a change. Together we can make a change. Change the food system. We can make a change. 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 Together we can make a change. We can make a change. Merci beaucoup. Euh, donc ce manifeste euh, comprend 13, euh, 13 points d'action euh, et euh, donc nous invitons euh, chacune des personnes présentes ici à, à le regarder plus en détail, euh, brièvement, pour euh, rappeler à toutes celles et ceux qui nous écoutent, ECVC est donc une organisation composée d'organisations paysannes, d'organisations de paysans et de personnes travaillant dans, euh, dans euh, les, les fermes. Euh, nous, sommes, euh, à, nous avons des organisations à travers toute l'Europe, 31 organisations, et au-delà également de l'Union européenne. Euh, je vais maintenant passer la parole à M. Andoni Garcia, qui est membre du comité de coordination euh, de CVC, qui parlera donc en espagnol. Je vous invite à, à, à utiliser les, les casques si jamais c'est nécessaire. Euh, Andoni Garcia est, est paysan dans le Pays Basque. À toi la parole. Buenos días eh, a todos y a todas. Megunon. Muchas gracias, eh, señor comisario, por eh, dar voz a los pequeños y medianos agricultores, campesinos, eh, en esta jornada y en toda su trayectoria como comisario de eh, Agricultura. Al mismo tiempo le queremos agradecer este, este, este planteamiento de esperanza que, que nos hace cuando está hablando del futuro de la nueva PAC eh, o de la nueva PAC que venga a partir del 2027, donde los pequeños campesinos eh, sea el, el objetivo de, de estas políticas. Eh, queremos eh, agradecerle profundamente su participación en este evento y ese reconocimiento eh, también institucional a la voz de los pequeños y medianos eh, campesinos eh, a través de nuestra organización eh, que lo representa ECBC. Eh, por otra parte, también agradecer y, y de, de una manera muy, muy cercana también a, a Peter Smith y al Comité Económico y Social por, por eh, acogernos en esta casa de la sociedad civil organizada. Eh, Peter, eh, nos conocemos eh, a partir de, de, también de mi participación como eh, consejero en este comité y, y también nos has posibilitado en muchos momentos eh, nuestra voz y nuestra participación. Eh, por una parte, en el manifiesto que, que realizamos con motivo de, del día de 17 de abril, día de las luchas campesinas, eh, el, el comité firmó nuestro manifiesto y también, eh, a través de, de tu participación, Peter, posibilitaste que, que aquí en el, en el comité pudiéramos expresar y pudiéramos eh, trasladar todo este manifiesto que decía queremos más y necesitamos más agricultores y agricultoras en, en Europa. Y este es un, un, nuestro lema y este es nuestro eje, eh, que, que también lo traemos eh, aquí, en esta, en esta conferencia, eh, donde estamos diciendo que necesitamos más granjas en toda Europa eh, y una hoja de, de ruta para la territorialización de los sistemas alimentarios europeos. 
Peter, como ves, hablamos de sistemas alimentarios y también te queremos re reconocer que eh, conjuntamente con, con ECBC hemos estado reclamando una política eh, eh, alimentaria europea y lo seguimos reclamando. Este, este encuentro es un encuentro que queremos lanzarlo desde, desde la esperanza. Aunque vayamos a hablar, y el comisario nos, nos ha trasladado algunos, algunos datos, eh, desde luego muy, más que preocupantes, ¿no? la pérdida de, de millones de, de campesinos y, y campesinas en, en la última década, eh, es, un, es un drama, y es un drama que se tiene que abordar, que se tiene que, que enfrentar y se tiene que paralizar. Pero… Hablamos de esperanza y este encuentro y esta conferencia creemos que, que sirva para ello, porque mientras que hay luchas, mientras que hay resistencias, mientras que haya resiliencias, hay esperanza. ¿Y esperanza por qué? Pues porque estamos convencidos y así también eh, lo, lo indican muchas organizaciones que nos acompañan, de la sociedad civil organizada, por otra parte, también investigadores, también en, en la clase política, reconocen que el papel de los pequeños y medianos campesinos, pequeños y medianos agricultores y agricultoras, son la clave de afrontar esta crisis sistémica que se agudiza y se está agudizando por la crisis de, de Ucrania, que la pone, eh, si cabe, más a la, a la vista de, de, de la situación pero que también esta jornada y, y todos los, los que lo componemos creemos que es posible cambiar y afrontar esta crisis eh, porque obligatoriamente tenemos que, que afrontarla y eso significa directamente abordar cuál es la situación y cuáles son eh, los cambios que, que necesitamos eh, afrontar. Tenemos eh, un marco político de, en esta Comisión Europea que se lanzó con el Pacto Verde Europeo y la Estrategia de, de la Granja a la Mesa. Objetivos que, que compartimos, parece que son objetivos importantes para afrontar el, la situación, este, esta situación de crisis sistémica, la situación sobre el cambio climático, pero nos encontramos con que no vemos suficientes instrumentos y medidas para afrontar esos objetivos y estamos viendo que en tres años es posible que estén dándose retrocesos en respecto de esos objetivos y esos planteamientos. Tenemos una nueva PAC que ha comenzado al 1 de enero de este 2023 y es una, una PAC que cambia, tiene muchos elementos de, de cambio, elementos eh, importantes, en muchos casos burocráticos, en muchos casos difíciles de afrontar, desde eh, nuevas exigencias en la digitalización, la tecnificación, muchos elementos, muchos elementos que están ahí, que en principio son importantes, pero al mismo tiempo decimos no tiene suficientes instrumentos, no tiene instrumentos de regulación, para nosotros imprescindibles cuando hablamos de precios que tiene que acompañar los costes de producción, y por otra parte las ayudas, y en este caso ayudas que van unidas a la condicionalidad reforzada, a los ecoesquemas, bien, están, están bien, pero no son suficientes y no son eficaces para afrontar los cambios que necesitamos. Esto es muy importante. Necesitamos cambios. Nosotros no estamos en el status quo. El status quo no nos sirve. A los pequeños y medianos agricultores, campesinos y campesinas no nos sirve el status quo. Se debe de afrontar los cambios. Porque, claro, vemos, eh, nos habla el comisario y con todo respeto, nos habla de, de la importancia de, de Europa en el marco mundial y en la producción de alimentos. Eh, pero nosotros vemos qué, qué sucede en ese marco y vemos que la competencia que hay entre, entre agricultores eh, 
de unas partes del mundo y otras, lo que está generando es una reducción de precios por debajo de, en muchos casos, de los costes en origen y destino, donde quien se beneficia de todo ello son las grandes corporaciones, grandes eh, empresas que están, o grandes industrias, la distribución o las multinacionales que están en la agroexportación. Y nosotros sufrimos los, los impactos de esas políticas. Sufrimos los impactos de un, una contradicción inmensa que tiene el Pacto Verde Europeo y la política comercial europea. Y recibimos esos impactos. Entonces, esto se debe abordar con cambios y se debe de ver que la pérdida de soberanía alimentaria que estamos teniendo en Europa y que la entregamos a ese mercado más globalizado tiene unos impactos directos en los pequeños y medianos agricultores y campesinos en Europa. Eh, la reducción de esos millones de, de campesinos tiene que ver directamente con las políticas y una de ellas eh, la política comercial tiene ese impacto eh, muy, muy directo. Además, hay elementos que hay que abordar urgentemente. Eh, la evolución de la agricultura en Europa está siendo más que preocupante. Además de la pérdida de, de granjas y, y de fincas pequeñas y medianas, estamos viendo cómo están entrando fondos de, de inversión a la agricultura. Fondos de inversión, grandes empresas comprando tierra y producción, ocupando el espacio de las pequeñas y medianas eh, granjas y fincas. Y esto es algo absolutamente preocupante. En el Estado español prácticamente se ha pasado eh, desde el 2000 desde el 2004 a 2020 se si había siete fondos de inversión, ahora hay 300 fondos de inversión comprando tierra y, y produciendo. Ese es el modelo de agricultura al que tiene que caminar la Unión Europea. Directamente, seguro, seguro que en esta casa la respuesta general será que no, que ese no puede ser el modelo. Pero esto está ocurriendo y el dato en, del, del Estado español está ahí, pero ayer teníamos la reunión eh, en, en ECPC y estamos viendo que en otras partes también de, de Europa, en otros países, está ocurriendo todo este fenómeno. Y esto se tiene que frenar, tiene que frenarse urgentemente. Primero, por, porque ¿cuál es el futuro para los jóvenes? ¿Cómo se incorporan los jóvenes si la especulación sobre la tierra la ocupación de los mercados por la, eh, a través de, de la producción, ¿qué queda para los jóvenes en un futuro? Si los datos eh, que, que usted eh, también nos dio en la conferencia ULUC, si en este momento la, los agricultores en, en Europa tienen una edad de 57 años, la edad media, pero en el Estado español, por ejemplo, en los próximos 10 años se va a jubilar el 60% de agricultores. Esto es de pánico, ¿verdad? Esto es impresionante y algo tendremos que hacer. Eh, es urgente abordar la incorporación de jóvenes. Es el futuro. ¿Y cómo se hace si ocupamos producción y tierra? ¿Cómo se hace todo esto? ¿Cómo se hace si al final hemos entregado la soberanía alimentaria europea a esos, eh, a esos mercados? ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo se realiza si no hay un cambio claro de políticas, de las políticas europeas. Necesitamos recuperar la soberanía alimentaria, necesitamos recuperar instrumentos de regulación de los mercados. Tenemos que hablar de precios que acompañen una producción definida, una producción eh, en claves de sostenibilidad y que camine hacia la agroecología. Necesitamos esos instrumentos de mercado, necesitamos hablar de precios y necesitamos hablar también de ayudas dirigidas muy claramente a los pequeños y medianos agricultores. En esta conferencia queremos abordar todos estos elementos en las distintas mesas que de participación vamos a abordar, por una parte, eh, cuáles son las claves y cómo podemos poner en el centro de las políticas a los pequeños y medianos agricultores. Cómo podemos 
eh, eh, cuáles son las claves para hablar de sistemas alimentarios sostenibles, la importancia de los mercados locales, de la venta directa, de los circuitos cortos, de la relación de los agricultores con, con la ciudadanía, con los consumidores. Queremos hablar de la regulación, desde luego, de los mercados y, y cómo esa regulación puede contribuir directamente a que haya más agricultores en Europa. Estamos planteando que haya eh, para el 2040 más de otros 10 millones de eh, agricultores campesinos y campesinas en Europa. Queremos que haya más agricultores. Y tenemos también un elemento clave y es, eh, en las mesas, es el tema de la tierra. Tenemos que abordar eh, lo que está sucediendo y nuestra clave y nuestro posicionamiento sobre una directiva marco en defensa de la tierra para posibilitar la incorporación de más personas, más agricultores y agricultoras en Europa. Estas son eh, las distintas mesas en las que se va a transcurrir todo este, este encuentro. Desde luego también agradecer eh, la participación, en este caso también, de, de, del Comité Económico y Social, que va a participar con nosotros eh, y nosotras en, en las distintas mesas, a, a Josep Pucheu, compañero, amigo eh, de, de ECBC y de COAG, en este caso como organización de, de ECBC, y también a Kerli Atz, también de, del Comité Económico y Social, eh, que también va a participar en, en las mesas. Eh, agradecer de nuevo, comisario. Y, y como antes no, nos ha nos ha indicado en su exposición y, además, le agradecemos mucho que pueda continuar con nosotros eh, todavía un tiempo más, pues ya abrimos así las, las mesas. Así que una pregunta que queda en el aire. ¿Qué cambios necesitamos en las políticas para poner en el centro a los pequeños y medianos agricultores? ¿Y cómo abordamos esa, ese modelo de eh, no sé si se puede llamar agricultura, pero lo que está pasando con esa industrialización que se está dando, esa ocupación de tierra y territorio y producción por esas grandes empresas, ¿cómo podemos frenar todo ese, ese camino que no es el desable y que es absolutamente rechazable y que tenemos eh, que abordar un cambio claro de políticas? Muchas gracias. Merci, Andoni, pour ces paroles d'ouverture de la part de CVC. Je voudrais maintenant me tourner vers le commissaire, puisque, monsieur le commissaire, vous êtes là pendant quelques minutes encore. Est-ce que vous souhaitez répondre maintenant à la question que vient de soulever Andoni Garcia sur euh, quels sont les, les, les outils euh, que nous pouvons mettre en place afin de permettre l'installation de plus de paysages et de paysans ici en Union européenne Je vous donne la parole. It was very interesting uh, the presentation of the problems which we have and uh, very good question what we should do to to change the this this situation. I think that uh, this our approach to the future common agriculture policy should be based on the uh, uh, on the uh, principle the four s security stability sustainability and solidarity the security food security for our for our citizens our consumers stability for our farmers stable situation of the the the, the farmers Sustainability, this is support for the sust sustainable agriculture. This is farm to fork strategy. This is this direction to make our, our uh, farming more friendly for environment, for climate, and at the same time, the, our agriculture policy more friendly for farmers. And solidarity, this is our role with uh, uh, in the global food system our contribution to, to ensure food security at the, the, the global level, to, to support uh, countries, the, the people being in the situation in the risk of the, at, at the risk of the food insecurity. But to, to, to achieve these goals in all aspects, all four aspects, we need the small farmers. Maybe this is the, the fifth S, the small farmers. 
support for the small farmers. Uh, but this is the, the, the complex of the, the challenges. This is not only the, the um, economic aspect. No, I'm sure that in the future common agricultural policy, this direction should be, should be strengthened. More support for the, for the small-scale farmers. The redistributive payment, the, the concept of the eco schemes, I, I think that it will be continued in the future policy, the, the eco schemes, because there is like, uh, no, for example, the, the, the most controversial now, the, the issue, the type of, of the animal production, animal farming. There is strong uh, pressure to, uh, to reduce uh, meat production, meat consumption, to reduce uh, uh, animal farming in the European Union. But my position is that we should support the mixed production, the sustainable production, farms with, uh, with uh, crop production and animal production because in this type of farms we can uh, 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 achieve the, this, this sustainable, uh, sustainable development of, the, of the, our food system. And this is very important. Unfortunately, in the last decade, we lost majority of farms we, which we lost. They, they are mixed farms. They were mixed farms. This is a very negative uh, trend that we lost many mixed farms. Farmers joining the two, two types of, of, of production. Uh, this is the also also the question of uh, of um, rural areas development of rural areas is and synergy of the all European policies. First of all, synergy between uh, common agricultural policy and cohesion policy. In the Article uh, 174 of the treaty, they are they are defined the objectives of the cohesion policy. And uh, uh, the rural areas are mentioned in this, this article at the first position that we should support uh, rural areas, uh, post-industrial areas, and areas with uh, uh, no outermost regions, that's, that's this, this, this type of, of, of regions. And in practice, you now we can observe that the cohesion funds are spent, first of all, for the urban areas. And we have many problems in the rural areas like uh, 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 communication exclusion. The, the, in many parts of the Europe, the public transport uh, doesn't exist in the, in the rural areas. I co can observe also in my, my country, Poland, that it's very difficult to, to, to uh, for the people access to the to the to the public service to, because there is a lack of the transport who is not has not private car or, or is not able to drive many people they old people for example there is a very difficult situation of these people and uh, we have absolutely this is the challenge to to improve the condition of life on rural areas because many many people they, they would be able to, to continue the farming, in the, including the small farms, maybe having other jobs and then to be uh, two, two professions, not only the, 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 the farming, but uh, they, they would be able to continue the, the uh, farming. But the condition of life in rural areas, there, there is the main reason that they decide, no, sorry, thank you, I will be not, not, not the farmer in the future. Uh, but uh, and uh, it should be the synergy be between the, the, the policies and real uh, preference for the rural areas in the cohesion policy. This is very important. We will not solve all problems only because of the CAP budget. And also the question of the budget. We have um, in uh, for for the seven years uh, uh, one uh, for, uh, European budget for the common agricultural policy is 387 billion euro. For the next five years, including um, uh, co-financing, uh, na national co-financing, we have three 307 billion euro. This is the total amount um, in the strategic plans we, we, which we approved last year. But this is. This is only 0.4% of the European Union GDP. 
we pay for the for our food security we spend 0.4 percent of the gdp i remember a debate about the uh, uh, budget and there was very strong pressure from the, the countries there were club of the countries saving the, the the money there was pressure to reduce the budget <coughs> no we should uh, this is one of the mm, one of the conclusions from the the current situation also the from the results of the agricultural census in in uh, 2020 that we should to we, we have to um, stronger budget for the common agricultural policy. 0.4% is not enough for the, to, to, to ensure po food security in the such difficult circumstances which we have. Climate events uh, affecting uh, farmers very, very much and now the political situation that the crisis uh, caused by the, by the war probably we we hope that, that this war will, will uh, be uh, uh, finished in the, with win of uh, Ukraine uh, as, as, as quick as possible, but we can take also into account that the situation will be difficult long time. We need to strengthen the support for, for, for our f farmers and common agriculture policy should have stronger budget, more support for farmers in the crisis situation. No, and I fully agree with, with uh, Mr. Garcia and uh, with the, uh, the main sentence of this, this, this conference, more farmers across Europe. Yes, we need more farmers in European Union. Absolutely, we need more farmers. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Commissaire. Euh, maintenant, j'imagine que tout le monde a hâte euh, de savoir ce que, euh, ce que va développer ECVC dans, dans, les prochaines, euh, dans la prochaine heure, les prochaines heures qui, qui se profilent. Euh, nous avons donc décidé, comme l'a annoncé Andoni tout à l'heure, euh, de, euh, de se pencher sur trois thèmes principaux que nous pensons cruciaux pour euh, cette, euh, donc, euh, cette feuille de route. Euh, la, le premier débat dans lequel nous voudrions entrer est la question euh, du foncier, la question de l'accès aux terres agricoles. Pour traiter de cette question, euh, nous avons trois, trois invités ici. Euh, je les remercie beaucoup d'être présents. Nous avons donc M. Fergal Anderson, qui est donc paysan en Irlande, euh, représentant de ECVC et membre de l'organisation irlandaise Talav Beo. J'espère que j'ai prononcé ce gaélique comme il faut. Euh, nous avons Mme Isabelle Carvalhaich, euh, membre du Parlement européen. Et nous avons M. José Puxeu Rocamora, j'espère également l'avoir bien prononcé, euh, qui est donc représentant du Comité économique et social européen. Euh, Peut-être avant de commencer le débat, nous voudrions euh, vous remettre officiellement la proposition de directive sur euh, les terres agricoles euh, que nous avons ici. Donc je vais euh, demander à, à Fergal euh, de vous la remettre. Si monsieur le commissaire, vous voulez bien euh, euh, également vous lever, nous allons faire une petite photo de cette euh, remise officielle de la directive. <rire> <coughs> okay. Thank you. Je pourrais également proposer à Andoni, Geneviève et Alessandra, si vous voulez également y aller. Si vous voulez venir aussi. Et venir à la photo. Merci beaucoup. 
Et donc, euh, maintenant que tout le monde a hâte de savoir ce qui se trouve dans cette directive, je passe directement la parole à Fergal pour nous la présenter. Thank you, uh, Emma. And thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, so, as Emma mentioned, my name is Fergal Anderson. I'm a farmer in the west of Ireland, producing fruit and vegetables for direct sale into local markets. And in my area of the world, there's a living memory of land redistribution. Um, the Irish Land Commission, which was established following independence, redistributed the land of large estates uh, to farmers and their families. Then there are farmers, my neighbours, who farm land which was apportioned to them or transferred, made available to them by the state through those policies. And that process created livelihoods for those farmers and their families and enabled them to produce food. So it also created the fabric of rural society as we know and recognise, which our culture celebrates uh, and which sustains the social and environmental balance in our region. That social, environmental and cultural balance is under threat uh, for a variety of reasons, but the, the one that farmers fear most is the loss of their land. Um, a loss to monoculture plantations uh, of forestry owned by hedge funds and investment firms, loss to mining projects, uh, loss to gross infrastructure developments, loss to mass production facilities uh, with large-scale mechanised silage harvesting operations and, and so on. The, the, the loss of those farms to excesses of global capital expansion are more than numbers on a page or statistics in a book. They mean the loss of families, uh, communities, future generations on the land, which in many countries form the origin of our cultures and which define the particularities of our language, our food, uh, our music and our identities in Europe. So across, this, across the continent, those scenes are repeating themselves uh, in different ways, in very different legal and institutional contexts. Um, however, the result is the same as the Commission has admitted itself in its interpretive communication of 2017. Uh, the tendency is to an increase in foreign capital acquisitions of agricultural land. In Europe, 25% of landowners already control 90% of agricultural land. And that trend is increasing and it must be halted and then reversed through positive policy intervention. Everywhere in Europe we see land concentration, we see land speculation and we see land abandonment. Uh, at the same time as we see new entrants being locked out of any kind of productive interaction with the natural world. Uh, there are many people who are eager to engage in a positive way with food production, uh, in rural and economic social development and in the revitalization of our countrysides. They just need structured, affordable access to land and that's something that's almost impossible to find through the market in Europe today. Uh, we are here today as the European Coordination via Campesina to present uh, and propose a comprehensive, practical and necessary land directive for Europe. The EU has acknowledged the importance of agricultural land uh, and of course many existing EU policies have uh, impacts on land, for example the Common Agricultural Policy, of course, uh, land use, land use change, forestry and the soil health law. But the impact of these policies make it even more necessary to harmonise how member states deal with the land issue in their regions in order to protect citizens and rural communities who face increasingly unpredictable and unstable market conditions, as well as more and more mobile and complex transnational investment. The European coordination has worked tirelessly to keep land on the agenda. Um, the struggles against the Rosia Montana gold mine in 2013 first highlighted the issue and we published a report on land grabbing in Europe with the Hands Off the Land Network that same year. Uh, a petition was handed to the European Parliament in 2015, and in that year the EASC published an opinion on the threats to family farming in Europe caused by land grabbing. The EESC uh, called for member states to implement the voluntary guidelines for responsible governance of land tenure uh, and for restrictions on transactions. So the EESC also acknowledged that land is no ordinary commodity and that the usual market rules should not apply. And I think I can stand here or sit here today in front of you and categorically say that every farmer in Europe would agree wholeheartedly with those sentiments and every citizen would understand and respect them. Yeah, year upon year, the limitations of the market are becoming clearer. It's incapacity to respond to crisis, it's creation of structural inequalities, it's disruption of societal structures and human relations, and it's contempt for and gross undervaluation of the natural world. Uh, nowhere is this more clear than where the market is engaged in the ongoing commodification of agricultural land. In 2017, the European Parliament followed the EESC opinion with its own. It called for a more holistic approach to land governance uh, that is based not solely on economic criteria, 
but also social, cultural and environmental principles. Uh, the Parliament also recognised and highlighted many of the problems we have already mentioned, difficulties in accessing land for new entrants, the industrialisation of agriculture, land concentration and so on. They recommended prioritising small and medium-sized uh, producers, new and young farmers using tools such as preemption rights, ceilings on purchase areas, the creation of land banks, uh, index pricing and, and so on. Since then, corporate finance has continued to move into the agricultural space and more and more the main actors in land markets are investment firms and transnational groups rather than, land, uh, than local farmers uh, and communities. Uh, in Ireland last year, more than 40% of all tr property transactions were undertaken between business structures rather than uh, individuals. So the ECVC now propose a clear pathway forward, the implementation of a European directive on agricultural land. The directive we're presenting to you here was drafted in conversation with lawyers, uh, allied organisations, academics uh, and legal experts. The directive includes measures to prevent land grabbing and land concentration, including ceilings on land ownership, uh, measures to facilitate access to land, which is one of the most pressing issues facing Europe today, measures for soil protection, measures to protect common and public land, and measures on forest land and coastal farming. Importantly, it would also establish observatories of agricultural on land uh, in EU member states. This directive could provide minimum standards, and I hope you all get a chance to read it because it's very comprehensive. Uh, minimum standards and harmonization of land policy across Europe uh, can regulate land transactions, fight speculation, promote the establishment of young farmers, all while ensuring the vital vitality of the countryside, preserving peasant model of farming, defending peasant rights and promoting food sovereignty. It both complements and reinforces the other priorities that we're talking about today, which are agroecology, short supply chains, uh, uh, sustainable food systems, fair prices, market regulation, food sovereignty. In fact, land is the nexus upon which all those rest. And this directive provides, provide a sound foundation to uh, an evolution in the European food system, to one which can meet the challenges of climate change, uh, biodiversity loss and flawed global markets and which can ensure more farmers and better food in Europe. Here in this building, the EESC committed with its opinion uh, 632 to continue in the future to closely monitor land concentration, study its effects, and be involved in drawing up proposals for containing it. So I'd ask the European Commission and the Commissioner here today to, comment, uh, to commit to acting on this issue, uh, to proceed with this process, and to use this directive to guarantee safeguard and renew the structures and fabric of our rural society and ensure another generation can continue living and working on the land with all the positives that brings to our society, culture, landscape and environment. So it's a historic moment that we're in. There's a very uncertain future um, and there's huge risks and stability ahead. We've already, we're already seeing the impact of climate change, conflict and market instability uh, and the demonstra they, they demonstrate the need for strong leadership and the importance of food sovereignty and ec agroecology in Europe. If we value our farmers, our food, our landscape and our cultures, then the EU must step in to protect them from these external threats and uh, commit to a land directive uh, for Europe. Thank you. Uh, for this. Merci beaucoup, Fergal. Sans plus attendre, je passe la parole à Madame Carvalhaich. Thank you so much. Ah, okay, okay, so now it's connected. So thank you, uh, dear all. And I I'm feel most honored to be here today. And my first words would be to thank to the European coordinator via, uh, via uh, coordination via Campesina for this most kind invitation and to the European Economic and Social Committee uh, for uh, um, receiving us, for hosting uh, this, this important event. Um, I will go through my written lines because English is not my native, uh, I'm a, not a native speaker, so it's always easier, otherwise I will get lost, especially because those who know me know how passionate I am, I am sometimes uh, when advocating something, so I, I get lost, uh, so it's better to, to go through the, uh, the, the, the things, the, the written uh, notes I have. Um, I suppose that some of you at least know that uh, the European Parliament is currently preparing an initiative report dedicated to generational renewal in farming across Europe. And I have the pleasure of being the uh, rapporteur. I was also previously the rapporteur for the long-term vision of, for the rural areas. And now this is a new file that I'm very, uh, very eager to, to work on. 
And therefore, I have been following very attentively the issues regarding access to land and farmland markets, especially because the problems of land access impact particularly on young people, the very same that we would like to attract for farming uh, in the future. It is, understandable, it is undeniable that access to land has become one of the largest barriers for new entrants to farming in Europe. And this has been confirmed by several studies, and it's confirmed also on a daily basis, and I witnessed that also in my field contacts in my country, in Portugal. Uh, in the public consultation conducted in 2017 on modernizing and simplifying the CAP, for instance, the prices and availability of land was clearly the number one barrier identified, mentioned by nearly 30% of the responders. So this is not a new issue as we know. Access to land is narrowed by the limited availability of land for sale or rent in many regions, but also by the rising prices of agricultural land. We all know this as well. Land, as said on so many occasions, and we read this on, in so many important reports, is a finite resource. The competition among existing farmers, uh, new investors, including outside investors, the competing uses of land for a variety of activities, not necessarily connected to agri-production, along with the high investment needed to start the farming activity, create globally enormous obstacles to young farmers, especially for those who are entering the activity from outside a family context. What can be done to contradict this gloomy picture? We often hear that member states have to respect the four freedoms of the single market, the freedom of persons, of goods, of capital and services. And they must be protected, of course, as the single market is at the very heart of our common project and enables citizens to travel, to live, to work, to study, to, study, to, to do whatever they want, uh, wherever uh, they wish. In parallel, we also know that member states have jurisdiction and discretion to regulate land markets and that too must be respected. So I'm not against this. However, the principles of the single market do not exhaust the ensemble of foundational principles of the single mark, uh, uh, of principles inscribed in the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union. There are other principles equally important and equally protected by the treaty, namely the principles, the goals of the CAP of ensuring a fair standard of living for the agricultural community and which takes account of the particular nature of the agricultural activity. And there are other relevant principles too to be respected that the EU is committed to promote, such as food security and food affordability for its populations. So this means that land access in Europe, um, as we know, is not uh, only a problem, but one that must be solved for various reasons, namely for the sake of our rural world. Uh, if we are truly engaged in this, because quite frankly, I also hear many people, and this I'm skipping from my written notes, many people, they are basically, you know, entrepreneurs of agriculture. So whether they are doing vertical agriculture in city uh, buildings or with land, it, and as long it, as it is profitable, it's fine for them. Because in these cases, land for them is a commodity. And so if we are truly engaged, because sometimes I think uh, we're not all in the same page when we are outside this room, engaged in, in trying to uh, uh, take good care of the rural world as it is and respect it for its own identity, then of course land access is a problem. And it must be solved, not just you know, acknowledge that it is a problem. Fortunately, the good thing is this has been a deeply discussed theme over the last years. Uh, I would mention as examples the very interesting, and, and it was already mentioned here, the very interesting work uh, conducted by the European Economic and Social Committee with its, with its opinion in 2015 on the imminent threat of land grabbing to family farm. 
I should say that as an academic, the first time I was aware of land grabbing, it was not in Europe. It was in Sierra Leone. Uh, because I had a student who was from there and he wanted to study the case of land grabbing in Africa. So usually people see these things about land grabbing as you know, an issue happening somewhere else, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. Uh, also, uh, uh, the excellent work conducted by my colleague Maria Norsch, I haven't seen her uh, so far, but I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if she will be, I'm sure she will, no, yeah, yeah, later, okay, so, but, but it's a very interesting work uh, that she conducted uh, uh, in the European Parliament's report of 2017 on the state of affairs of farmland concentration in the European Union, and I must say that I agree widely with the main conclusion of both documents, that farmland markets need to be more and better regulated in order to contradict depopulation of the rural areas, in order to ensure the realization of the human right to food security, sustainable livelihoods, social stability and rural development, as stated so clearly by the FAO on its voluntary guidelines on governance tenure, goals that are definitely linked to the generational renewal in farms and rural areas. The Court of Justice of the European Union recognizes the specific nature of agricultural land in its rulings and has been recognized as a set of public interests and objectives that can justify under, cer under certain circumstances, the establishment of market regulation measures, su such as to preserve agricultural communities, to prevent price speculation and so forth, also to sustain and to develop viable agriculture, namely by keeping land intended for agriculture in such use. Many member states have measures to regulate land markets. But it would be, in my opinion, hugely beneficial to count on a more harmonized approach across all countries. And there would be much to be learned also from sharing some good practices which have been proved to be successful in certain countries. Of course, this is not about copy-pasting because uh, every measure has to be pla place-based. Uh, examples uh, of these are the preemptive rights in favor of farmers, in, and in particular of young farmers, price controls, prior authorization approval of agricultural land transfer, acquisition caps or obligations to maintain agricultural activity, among other measures that could be implemented. Of course, we should always keep in mind the diversity of farm realities across the EU not only in legal terms, but also in terms of the history of land structure, which is very much connected to natural and sociological aspects that must be acknowledged and respected. I, I, I was, when I was writing, I was thinking about Portugal, and the, I'm from the north, and the north has very tiny, very small farms. Well, sometimes they are less than half a, an hectare, so they're really tiny. Uh, but they express a sort of dialogue with natural and demographic uh, conditions that have been developed over the centuries. And this, this could never be contradicted, not even in the 19th century when there was this uh, impersonamento, politica de impersonamento, this policy of consolidation of land. It was not possible because, and this goes again to something I was saying before, there, are, there, there is a, a weight of emotional ties with the land. Farmland is definitely not a commodity for these people, for rural, for rural communities. It is an extension of a person's full identity, especially when it has been in the family for generations. Uh, aside also from what I'm saying, that is why it is so important communication. Last week I was in one of these uh, regions. Um, you know, local authorities are planning to do something very, very good in terms of, of um, uh, the management of, of local forest, of oak trees. 
what is very difficult is to uh, make local people understand they, that they are not that this is not a grabbing process, not at all. It's just a way to help them and, and also to you know to give them some profits from these ecological services they are providing to community. But the language and the communication is an issue because people are so attached to these lands, uh, you know, even if it's a tiny small amount of land, that they are always afraid that they may uh, you know be. Uh, deceived uh, by you know, political authorities, politicians, lawyers, and, and so. So this is a, a, a kind of a, a footnote, but communication of this is really important. And other, another aspect that I think is m very, very relevant is the transparency of agricultural land markets. Because correcting information asymmetries is a way to correct inefficient markets. I found very interesting the idea of a land observatory at the EU level, one that could be uh, explored, uh, for instance, in the framework of the rural observatory that has been recently launched by the European Commission and which is one of the measures put forward in the long-term vision for rural areas. And I think it would be very interesting uh, that the Commission could study this possibility instead of having another observatory. Why not in this rural observatory, if possible, to have this dimension for land observation? Uh, just a thought. Yeah. And, and finally, when talking about access to land in the context of generational renewal, it is also very important to consider that leasing also serves as a viable alternative by allowing young firmer, farmers and new entrants to gain access to land. However, it is often difficult to obtain a long-term contract, and this is important to guarantee sustainable land management and productivity. Member states should therefore adopt policies that promote long-term land leasing to young farmers and increase awareness of the advantages and benefits of long-term land leasing through engagement with all stakeholders, farming organizations and professionals within the farming sector. Other innovative ways of accessing land, such as land partnerships or land sharing arrangements that are also being developed in the north of my country, should also be incentivized. So these are good practices, I think. And finally, the challenge that young farmers face when trying to access land is, as we know, very difficult and very complex. And therefore, there are no single good answer to solve the problem. But I believe that there is a complementarity resulting from the implementation of several measures that would lead to a far better scenario than the one we have today. In any case, and to conclude, land grabbing and land concentration are the very denial of the rural world as we know it. Land grabbing and land concentration may be compatible with agriculture, some forms of agriculture, but there is no way it can be seen as synonym of, keep, of keeping the rural world alive. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Et si ça ne vous dérange pas, nous donnons tout de suite la parole au, à Monsieur le Commissaire pour qu'il puisse réagir à, à vos interventions. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Only a few words. First of all, thank you for very interesting presentations, Mr. Anderson, uh, Madame Deputy Carvalhais, uh, for your reflections and this very interesting idea. This uh, this directive. I'm not. I cannot to declare. The, 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 what would be the commission why, position why on the <laughs> No, no, because uh, no, there is uh, regulations about the ownership. This is the national competence. We should re remember that Article 345, and we are uh, our uh, possibilities on the European level. They are uh, limited. But many, many ideas which you include into this, this, this proposal of the directive, they are very interesting and. Mm, I can declare that I use these uh, ideas uh, in the proposals for the for the future common agriculture policy post 27. But also that uh, we will analyze the uh, legal aspects of this this initiative, and uh, of course because the from one hand that there is uh, national responsibility, the 
structure of, of, of ownership. From other hand, the access to land is very important uh, uh, a factor on the, the, the situation on the market, on the equal competition. That's, uh, this is a very, very uh, uh, interesting initiative. Thank you for that. And uh, I can declare my, my um, interest and, to, 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 and uh, future analyzing of the, the, the proposal. Thank you very much, and thank you again, Madam Karvalais, for your very interesting observations. Uh, and uh, yes, of course, that that's uh, the land grabbing. Uh, this 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 is the challenge we can observe. That this this process is in everywhere in the European Union. This is uh, the uh, more than 50. You mentioned in this this uh, proposal of the directive that. Uh, uh, Three percent of farmers, they, they uh, have more than majority of European land. Three percent is, is true. There's, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Mr. Beruti, my member of cabinet, they, they declared also the cooperation with, with the, our the cabinet and um, okay. Thank you very much again. It's a very interesting initiative, uh, very interesting uh, uh, basic document for the discussion about the future of the, uh, of the agriculture in the European Union. Thank you. Uh, let me apologize. I have to, to leave you. And uh, I wish you uh, very interesting debates. I'm very interested about the con uh, conclusions, recommendations, not only this document, but general from the discussion. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Commissaire, d'être venu aujourd'hui avec nous et de passer tout ce temps, tout ce temps avec nous. Euh, vous, euh, vous ne nous laissez pas tout seul. You are not leaving us alone because Monsieur Ricard Ramon will be staying with us from the Unit A1 of uh, DJ Agri. Uh, as we are a bit short in time, uh, I might be um, intervening more into asking you to shorten your presentations, dear speakers. Uh, but uh, I would like to now give the word to Mr. Jose Puxio Ramora, Ra Roca Mora. Sorry for that. Uh, over to you. Euh, merci, merci Emma, et merci, euh, je vais profiter de euh, partir euh, le commissaire euh, pour porter les ballons euh, sur le terrain. <rire> On va parler des choses euh, plus concrètes. Et, et pour que ne me passe lo, lo que le passe à Isabelle, comme mon anglais et mon français ne no sont pas mes langues maternes, tampoco le castellano, parce que je parle catalan. Mais je préfère que vous pongáis les cascos et ce que je veux vous raconter, qui va être très bref, je vais essayer de ceinirme à les 5 minutes, je veux que ce soit très clair. Je sens que nous sommes le commissaire, parce qu'il y a un rôle de toutes les institutions européennes. La Comisión también, por supuesto. Pero estoy encantado que estén nuestros colegas del Parlamento Europeo y aquí los amigos de Vía Campesina. Lo que están poniendo de manifiesto con su manifiesto y con su jornada de hoy es que Europa o juega un rol de liderazgo y provocación a nivel mundial o nos vamos a quedar fuera del sistema. Muchos de los temas que se han puesto durante esta mañana encima de la mesa afecta y impactan mucho más a otros territorios. Os lo digo claramente, es en África, es en América Latina, en zonas que no están en los medios de comunicación, o sea, hablamos mucho de la Amazonía, pero no hablamos del Gran Chaco. Por ejemplo, 11 de los 13 puertos fluviales para exportación de cereal del río Paraná son chinos. El 70% del maíz para el año 23 está en manos de operadores chinos y prácticamente el 50% del grano. ¿Nos afecta como Europa? Sí, procesos inflacionarios, tal cual, pero ese es el gran problema de la acumulación de materias primas agrarias. Andoni, gráficamente, 
eh, ha hecho uso de un lenguaje tradicional, las cinco grandes líderes de commodities. Bueno, esas cinco grandes líderes de commodities ahora tienen un nombre y apellidos, que es la inversión china. No solo en materias primas agrícolas, también en materiales raros, también en litio, también en otra serie de tomas de posición que nos dejan a Europa en una posición de viejos, pequeños consumidores, productores, fuera del sistema. Pues bien, yo creo que esta es la parte importante que vía campesina, pero el Parlamento Europeo, la Comisión y la sociedad civil debemos jugar ese rol, como mínimo de Pepito Grillo, si nosotros no defendemos los acuerdos de París del cambio climático, nadie más lo hará, nadie más lo hará. Si nosotros no lanzamos iniciativas, no es santa de mi devoción, pero debo decirlo así, eh, la comisaria von der Leyen, que, que continuó los trabajos de, de, de la anterior comisión, pero lanza la idea del Green Deal o lanza la idea de la estrategia de biodiversidad, si no lo lanza Europa, nadie más lo va a lanzar en el contexto mundial. Y en un mundo que estará la tendencia que no se globaliza, sino que se desglobaliza, renacionaliza, son esas nuevas grandes jugadores, esos grandes players, quien van a tomar las decisiones por nosotros. Por tanto, ese era lo que yo le quería decir al comisario. Por favor, por favor, no dejemos de actuar como vía campesina, como elementos de provocación. Podemos estar de acuerdo en todo, en parte o en una gran parte, pero o andamos en esa línea de provocar y exigir o nos vamos a quedar... Eh, fuera de la capacidad de influencia y al menos en el ámbito mínimo de derechos civiles, de democracia y de conciencia ciudadana, Europa debería jugar ese rol. Esa era mi, mi introducción para que el señor comisario lo lleve si quiere, a, pero está aquí eh, eh, su dirección general de agricultura para trasladarlo. Y vamos al tema concreto del uso del suelo en Europa. Los problemas no son los que han aparecido hasta ahora, lo siento, es el problema en mi país, pero también en Polonia y también en zonas de Portugal, es la despoblación flagrante. No quedan jóvenes, no, es que no quedan mujeres. Cuando se van las mujeres no hay jóvenes, no hay vida en los pueblos. Cada día vemos en la España vaciada, vaciándose cada vez más un tema de despoblación brutal. Las políticas de territorio no deben basarse sobre la política agrícola, para nada, y mucho menos sobre el presupuesto de las políticas agrícolas o la actividad agraria solo. Son políticas que deben tener un sesgo transversal, transversal, yo sé que Isabel ha trabajado en este tema en el Parlamento Europeo y coincido plenamente con ella, esa política transversal tiene que estar basada sobre las personas y los servicios y la capacidad de movilidad y la capacidad de acceso. Y nos pasa en las zonas nórdicas, pasa en Escandinavia, pasa en Finlandia, pasa en grandísimas zonas. No, no pasa en Luxemburgo y en Holanda, no es cierto, pero sí pasa en Irlanda y sí pasa en muchas otras. Es muy difícil vivir en el mundo rural y ahí no viene un chino a especular. Ahí en este momento nos están provocando con otra cuestión. Nosotros en una comarca muy difícil, de montaña, vecino al mar, no sé qué, no estamos tan lejos, estamos a 150 kilómetros de Barcelona, Intentamos durante los años 80, 90, 2000 recuperar viñedos y lanzar unas iniciativas de viticultura y vinos de alta calidad. Bien, pues nos han enfrentado a un debate absurdo, salvaje, de confrontación entre energías renovables y agricultura. Porque los pocos espacios agrarios, alguien, alguien sin tener ni la propiedad, ni hablar con la propiedad ni con los agricultores, ha pintado unos parques fotovoltaicos porque tenían una, punta de, una línea de acceso de evacuación eléctrica y han empezado procesos de expropiación sobre nuestras propiedades. Hemos tenido que crear plataformas y lo siento, señor comisario, no es una directiva europea, no es una norma nacional. Hemos tenido que acudir a las autoridades locales, nuestros ayuntamientos, para cambiar las ordenanzas municipales para impedir la implantación, la implantación de huertos fotovoltaicos donde nosotros tenemos los viñedos. Y nos han hecho aparecer frente a la opinión pública como los anti-energías renovables. Mentira. En mi casa, en mi explotación, nosotros cambiamos todos los sistemas de combustión por 
energía fotovoltaica hace ya seis años. Lo hicimos por convencimiento, porque tenemos una, la bodega y las fincas en agricultura ecológica y por un tema de costes, porque el precio actual del combustible fósil es no aceptable para la explotación agraria. No hay rendimientos que compensen ese gasoil a un euro o a más de un euro o ese kilovatio a precios desesperados. Por eso optamos, cierro, optamos por la energía renovable, pero no queremos que se nos confronten. Si queréis ver un resumen muy fácil de la situación que se está produciendo en, en nuestro caso y en otras zonas de Europa, os recomiendo que veáis una película muy impactante, Alcarrás, la premiaron con el oso de Berlín el año pasado, y es lo que nos está pasando, la vida pura y dura de una agricultura familiar subsistiendo y peleando, no contra un gigante inversor chino o un fondo brutal, no, contra una mala política de implantación de energías renovables que destrozan el poco suelo agrario útil y las pocas explotaciones agrarias útiles. Oye, absolutamente de acuerdo en las renovables, pero póngalas en los tejados de las naves industriales, póngalas en los parkings de los aeropuertos, póngalas en muchos sitios donde estaban cobrando la política agrícola común y ahora se están haciendo otro tipo de actuaciones, pero no lo metan en la poca agricultura que está existiendo en Europa. Ese era mi, 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 mi punto de vista local sobre un problema global y, si para los que digáis que no he concretado nada, es hoy por hoy el ordenamiento, el ordenamiento local el único que puede impedir este tipo de disparates. Y eso es, un poco a modo de conclusión, la experiencia que quería llevar. Os recomiendo que veáis esa película de Clara Simón, con unos críos que lo hacen maravilloso y explican realmente el impacto de una mala praxis en energías renovables sobre terrenos agrarios. Gracias. Gracias, señor Puxo Rocamora. Pour cet atterrissage dans la réalité, on essaie de, de rester les pieds dans cette réalité tout au long de cette discussion de toute façon. Euh, je propose de terminer cette, cette partie du débat sur la question du foncier ici. Euh, vous avez donné énormément de pistes, euh, énormément, vous avez énormément soulevé de, de problèmes mais aussi de pistes de solutions. Euh, on a appris qu'on était dans un tournant historique, donc c'est l'occasion de, de, saisir, de saisir cette opportunité. Maintenant, je vais me tourner vers euh, les, les orateurs et oratrices du prochain débat. Donc, nous avions prévu d'avoir Mme Neutschel, mais elle a dû annuler, euh, elle, elle n'a pas pu euh, venir au dernier moment. Donc, nous avons M. Thomas Weitz, je l'ai vu sortir, mais j'imagine qu'il va, il va rentrer tout de suite, <rire> qui a accepté de participer à ce débat et nous lui en sommes très reconnaissantes, évidemment. Euh, mais d'abord, je vais donner la parole à donc, euh, Madame Geneviève Savigny, qui est paysanne en France euh, et qui est représentante donc, euh, de CVC, euh, également membre de la Confédération Paysanne, le membre français de, de CVC. Ensuite, je donnerai la parole à Monsieur Thomas Weitz. Merci beaucoup d'être ici. Et ensuite, à Madame Kerli Hatz, euh, représentante euh, du SESE et également agricultrice elle-même et, euh, et présidente, voilà, directrice euh, de la Estonian Farmer Federation. Merci beaucoup d'être là et je donne la parole à Geneviève. Oui, bonjour, euh, bonjour à tout le monde. Euh, je vais essayer d'être rapide pour euh, ne pas laisser la place à la dernière aussi table ronde. Et avant de commencer, vraiment, je voudrais exprimer ma solidarité avec les millions de travailleurs, travailleuses, citoyens et citoyennes français et françaises qui vont manifester aujourd'hui contre la réforme des retraites qui est proposée par notre gouvernement, qui représenterait un terrible recul social et un recul social qui est inadmissible. Donc je voulais les saluer comme je ne suis pas avec eux et avec elles. Et je vais vous présenter donc assez rapidement la vision de ECVC pour un avenir durable dans un monde qui soit vivable. Pour nous, des systèmes alimentaires durables euh, assurent une alimentation de qualité pour tous et toutes, avec des modèles de production agricole, de transformation et de distribution qui assurent un travail décent tout au long de la chaîne. Et ceci en protégeant le monde vivant, dont notamment les humains, avec une utilisation sobre des ressources et un respect général de l'environnement, notamment, puisque c'est une urgence, la question du climat, 
euh, comme c'est exprimé dans le manifeste pour le climat sur lequel je vais m'appuyer pour cette présentation, ce qui vous permettra de retrouver ces, ces 13 mesures, mais également d'aller peut-être un petit peu plus loin et surtout de détailler certains aspects qui me paraissent euh, assez euh, importants et, et urgents. Euh, donc ces, ces mesures donc, sont poussées par les droits humains et par la justice sociale et non pas le business as usual, euh, c'est-à-dire euh, qui a été... Enfin, le, 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 les affaires, comme c'est le cas en fait actuellement, et qui montrent le désastre que cela peut provoquer. Donc ces propositions, elles sont basées sur les droits, et les droits humains notamment, c'est le droit à l'alimentation, et la déclaration des Nations Unies sur les droits des paysans et des autres personnes travaillant dans le monde rural, qui est une déclaration adoptée aux Nations Unies en 2018. Euh, donc c'est l'essentiel là-dessus. Donc pour avancer, ah c'est à toi il faut le dire. Voilà. <rire> bon je ne sais plus. Euh, c ces mesures donc ces mesures elles sont 13 et la première demande de changer l'agriculture. Donc là c'est nous que ça concerne les paysans et de continuer et de permettre à l'ensemble des paysans et des paysannes de, de changer et d'évoluer vers ce système qui nous paraît beaucoup plus durable et leur donner un avenir alors que la, la, la continuité de l'industrialisation de euh, n'avance pas. Donc ça, c'est l'agroécologie paysanne, telle que nous souhaitons la faire, euh, la faire avancer dans les campagnes en Europe, en mettant en avant de suite, tout de suite, arrêtons les fausses solutions, parce que ce, ce dont nous avons parlé par rapport à la terre, c'est la question aussi des crédits carbone, du marché qui se crée autour hein, de la renaturalisation, de la re-ensauvagement re, des espaces en compensation de pollution ailleurs qui crée un nouveau marché sur la terre donc encore plus de spéculation et qui est vraiment une catastrophe que l'Union Européenne je pense n'arrête pas et en tout cas euh, ne, ne fait rien pour vraiment stopper ce nouveau marché euh, sans compter alors d'autres euh, fausses solutions dont nous reparlerons un peu plus tard et qui sont incompatibles pour nous avec l'agroécologie la suivante donc l'agroécologie, on va faire bref à nouveau, c'est un processus de transformation individuelle sur nos fermes, mais aussi collectif dans les structures agraires, dans, dans ce qui est possible de faire dans nos, dans nos régions, de travailler avec la nature et non pas contre elle, de favoriser l'autonomie avec peu d'intrants, en favorisant la diversité, diversité cultivée, diversité des productions, diversité des systèmes et en assurant la nourriture pour tous, donc dans un souci de souveraineté alimentaire. Tu peux passer. Je passe sur les dix éléments de l'agroécologie que la FAO a bien présentés et qui sont la base de notre positionnement également. Tu peux passer. Voilà. Dans, dans, ce, dans ce cadre, l'agroécologie qui utilise moins d'intrants, donc moins d'énergie fossile, il faut des énergies humaines. Cette énergie humaine exige qu'on ait des fermes petites, moyennes, partout, avec, de façon à avoir cette, cette envie d'avoir des, des exploitations, il faut qu'il y ait des, rémuné, des, des, des rémunérations stables. On ne peut s'engager dans un changement sur le long terme que si on est sûr d'avoir une stabilité de revenus et une stabilité dans, dans, dans l'avenir. Bien sûr, les terres agricoles, c'est indispensable d'avoir accès à ces terres agricoles. Euh, et je, vais, je continue donc voilà sur ce qu'il faut donc pour avoir de l'agroécologie, ce dont nous avons besoin, c'est de protéger le droit des paysans sur les systèmes euh, semenciers euh, paysans, de cultiver la, la biodiversité et donc de s'opposer aussi à toutes ces techniques de génétiquement modifiées, que ce soit les nouveaux OGM comme les anciens, qui sont contraires alors, aux droits des paysans et des paysannes. Nous avons également extrêmement besoin d'un changement euh, et du développement de la formation agricole adaptée à l'agroécologie. Beaucoup de jeunes nous disent, dans, dans, dans la formation, on ne parle pas d'agroécologie, on parle toujours euh, des mêmes choses et nous, avons, nous ne trouvons pas euh, la, la formation qui nous convient. Donc c'est une, une, un aspect extrêmement important. Ça a été dit, mais la question de l'élevage est également primordiale. Avoir des fermes 
de polyculture élevage, hein, de, de cette agriculture qui mélange la culture et l'élevage, c'est ce qui permet d'être le plus durable, de recycler euh, les, les nutriments euh, dans, 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 la, dans les cultures et d'avoir euh, une, une, aussi euh, un élevage qui soit adapté à la production fourragère locale, hein, donc dans une re-territorialisation euh, de l'élevage également et d'avoir un, un, un troupeau européen adapté à la capacité fourragère européenne. Évidemment, l'eau est, est un problème. La, la question du partage de l'eau, euh, qui est déjà urgente dans certains pays, va le devenir dans d'autres pays. Et c'est aussi là quelque chose qui doit être intégré dans notre, dans notre vision. Next. Alors, développer l'agroécologie, je crois qu'il faut être clair, c'est que ça nécessite aussi de mettre un frein au développement de l'agriculture industrielle, mais pas seulement de l'agriculture industrielle, du système de production alimentaire et de production financière dérivée de la production agricole dont nous avons déjà parlé. Donc, évidemment, limiter, faire disparaître les fermes-usines, euh, réduire les fertilisants comme il est prévu dans la farm to fork, dans la, dans la stratégie de la ferme à la fourchette, limiter, supprimer ces importations de soja qui sont la base euh, de, la, de la production intensive alimentaire, et puis se mettre bien dans la tête que toutes les, les, les technologies euh, qu'on nous impose actuellement, qui sont présentées comme des solutions écologiques, euh, que ce soit euh, la viande, enfin la viande, les protéines fabriquées en laboratoire, euh, les, les techniques de, de nouvelles semences génétiquement modifiées, ne sont pas des solutions à la durabilité, puisqu'en général, elles ne s'adressent qu'à un problème, par exemple le bien-être animal ou euh, la consommation de terre, mais ce n'est pas une vision globale, et surtout, ça exclut les aspects sociaux et économiques, et ça ne laisse pas d'avenir à, aux agriculteurs sur le terrain. Donc ce sont des faux systèmes que la Commission européenne euh, a, laisse faire, puisque en fait, dans la, dans la stratégie de la ferme à la fourchette, il faut quand même se dire que ça fait partie d'un Green Deal qui, est, qui fait partie d'une stratégie de croissance. Et en général, dès qu'on entend parler de croissance, on sait qu'on va dans le mur. Donc euh, on ne peut pas avoir des, des bonnes solutions dans un mauvais paradigme. Et on passe à la diapo suivante. La, la question des, de, des systèmes alimentaires donc, doit aussi intégrer la question de l'accessibilité la, de et de l'accès des personnes les plus pauvres à l'alimentation. Primordial, savoir comment, dans une Europe qui devient de plus en plus pauvre, où plus de 50 millions de personnes n'ont pas accès à une alimentation euh, décente, euh, comment est-ce qu'on assure une alimentation de qualité Et dans cela, alors les chaînes plus courtes, vont avoir la, la capacité déjà de permettre aux communautés territoriales, donc aux responsables des, des collectivités territoriales, d'avoir un impact et aux citoyens aussi de s'engager dans une véritable réflexion sur comment euh, assurer au mieux l'alimentation euh, des, des personnes précaires, euh, des étudiants, des, des personnes âgées, dans une approche beaucoup plus différenciée qu'une simple vision globale euh, avec un marché global qui, en fait, à la fin finale, les gens n'ont pas accès à l'alimentation pour diverses raisons, mais qui doivent être traités, évidemment, au niveau global, avec une vision euh, qui n'empêche pas la production euh, locale, mais aussi avec des visions euh, territorialisées, hein, comme c'est un peu le cas euh, dans, dans ce que la France a essayé de faire dans ses programmes alimentaires territoriaux, avec une approche euh, avec des partenaires. Et c'est là où arrive le rôle de la, de la, démo, enfin de la gouvernance démocratique, hein, que ce soit au niveau euh, local comme à un niveau européen. Et on peut aller à la, à la, diapo, à la diapo finale, et euh, donc qui est un petit peu nos, nos recommandations clés par rapport à, à, au système euh, de, de la ferme à la fourchette. Donc une gouvernance juste qui inclut euh, tous les acteurs et pas seulement ceux qui sont actuellement dans le groupe de dialogue civil avec la commission euh, présidée par la DG Santé, où en fait, c'est beaucoup les représentants du, du, du business, quoi, et pas tellement la société civile. Donc là, on a, on a besoin d'améliorer. Améliorer donc la transition par les différents systèmes dont on a déjà parlé. Inté avoir une consistance, c'est-à-dire une cohérence entre les différentes politiques. Et, surtout, et donc, toujours avoir en tête 
que ce qu'on veut, c'est répondre aux droits humains, aux besoins humains, et pas aux besoins du marché qui sait très bien se débrouiller sans politique et qui a tout à fait les moyens euh, de continuer. Enfin, il a les moyens, on ne le souhaite pas, mais qui euh, veut euh, continuer à imposer sa loi et même d'une manière de plus en plus, euh, je dirais, catastrophique dans une situation environnementale extrêmement difficile. Et c'est terminé avec la, dia la diapo finale qui euh, résume, oh, il y a encore une di diapo, mais voilà, les 13 demandes euh, qui font partie de notre euh, manifeste. Merci beaucoup Geneviève. Donc euh, le manifeste est évidemment euh, accessible ici euh, sur la table et puis sur euh, notre site internet en plusieurs langues. Euh, J'invite maintenant M. Thomas Weitz. Merci beaucoup d'être avec nous aujourd'hui et à prendre la parole. Merci, madame, and uh, good morning, or good midday already. Uh, first of all, I'm an organic farmer in south of Austria and partly Slovenia, doing forestry, organic beekeeping, uh, and we also have some sheep. Uh, and uh, in my se second job, I'm a member of European Parliament and trying to uh, influence legislation. Uh, I think the commissioner has left in time. Um, there's still somebody here from the Commission that will need to hear uh, what uh, many of us and I also got to say. I mean, we have been debating here access to land, we have been debating how can we get more farmers, we have been debating all the uh, ecological uh, disasters that we're facing and uh, we have seen some proposals how to fix this or that. Uh, in fact, What we're actually doing in the European Union is every single day causing these problems. We're financing the cause of these problems. We're using all your taxpayers' money to actually accelerate the problems that we try to find solutions here. We have been in cap negotiations. Uh, the Commissioner knows what I'm talking about, colleagues know what I'm talking about. Uh, Did we actually manage to limit subsidies to a certain size of farms? You have been talking about commodities, you are international investors seeing land as commodities and investing. Yes, it's the invest in, investment and the return on investment is the subsidies that we're giving from taxpayers' money. So we are subsidizing the financial interest of big uh, investors. We could have stopped that by limiting the amount of money that we're able, that we're ready to give to a certain agricultural enterprise. We We Greens, we have advocated for a maximum of 60,000 euros. I don't know how many farmers are here that get more than 60,000, maybe zero. Uh, I, I don't, by the way. Huh? Uh, uh, but then, okay, we found a compromise even in Parliament for 100,000 euros, to limit it to 100,000 euros. This, I mean, look, I'm an Austrian. Yeah? In my region, the average size of farms is 20 hectares. So if I'm coming with one, 100,000 euros, they're asking me, in what world are you living, Thomas? Yeah? But okay, 100,000 euros. And did we manage? No. It was killed by the council, it was killed by governments, by prime ministers and agricultural ministers. There is no limit. And this is what makes it interesting for international investors to buy up the land. So if we want to stop this land concentration, let's stop funding it. We are paying for it. The second thing, uh, we, you, I saw in your program, I can sign up to all 13 points here. Uh, there's a, um, a, a request to rebalance uh, uh, land and animals. We had the proposal in the CAP to actually link CAP subsidies to a certain amount of land to a certain amount of animals. Did we succeed? No, surprise, because the lobbies of the big uh, f uh, uh, animal farms and mass breeding farms have succeeded here again. So we are funding that. Uh, we, have limits, uh, we have limits now uh, in relation to investment subsidies. Most of the countries have limits, low limits. So they say you have to invest minimum 10 or 15,000 euros, otherwise you're not eligible for, for fundings for the investments. It's different in different member states, but in most member states you have a great, quite high threshold. Does this serve small farmers and keeping small farmers on the land? No, it's the opposite. It tells you if you're not big enough, find a job and stop farming. And do we have an upper limit on investments, a maximum, that we can give for investments into big stables, into big machinery? No. You can ask for as much as you want, and if there's still money in the pot, you will get it. I could go on now for another, I would say, one hour, only presenting examples of how we are financing exactly the disaster that you all here and we all here in the room try to find solutions to. So, in fact, 
you're saying we need more farmers on the ground. Mm -hmm. We're losing how many every day? 1,000? 800? Something between 800 and 1,000. Every single day. So don't get me wrong, but I would rather say uh, let's find first ways to stop losing that many farmers every single day. Let's stop, let's stop that first. Because if you once lose the farmers on the, in the region, it's very hard to rebuild these structures, very hard. And it's also very hard to develop local food systems, to, to develop direct marketing systems. If you don't have the farmers on the ground, you know a farmer with 500 hectares will never engage into direct marketing for local markets, because that just doesn't work like that. It is related and linked to small farmers, and if they are once gone, it is very hard to rebuild that, sometimes even impossible to rebuild it. So we need to focus on keeping the ones on the land that we have. But then if you look, I mean, in my region, every single day, I know neighbors that give up. Why do they give up? They love farming. They have family farms that have been run for sometimes hundreds of years, and they still give it up. Why? Because working for three, hour, three euros an hour is not an option at a certain point. And farmers that have animals go 365 days to their stables. And if they don't go themselves, they have to find someone to do it instead of them. If you find a job, it's nine to five, you have weekend, you have holidays, and you earn three times the amount of money, sometimes with better social security than you have on farming. So it's also very much about the income of farmers. And this income can not only come from subsidies, it has to come from fair prices for the product. And as long as we do not get fair prices for the product, we, will, we are in trouble. And if you look at the whole value chain, what do, what do the farmers get for their produce? Let's take apples. What is it? 15 cents, 18 cents, 20 cents per kilo, maybe 25 cents per kilo, and then look into the supermarket what you, what you pay. So there's a lot of people earning well, well in agriculture. It's the machinery industry, it's the chemical industry, pesticide industry, it's the, it's the uh, medication industry, uh, it's the wholesalers, the retailers, the wealth traders. They all earn super well. The only ones that do not earn super well is the actual producers on the ground, is the farmers. So we have to look into this and we have to find solutions to this. So basically what I'm advocating is uh, let's look into what is actually going on on the ground every single day. We now, I mean this is a bit technical now, but we have these negotiations on industrial emission, emissions and the question from which level on will farms need to report and pay and so on and make sure that their emissions. Uh, uh, the commission had a rather good proposal, 150, which okay, who has more than 120 cows here? Someone? No? Okay, but it's still big for us. For me, this is still big, yeah? But, but yeah, yeah, that's my reality. But okay, 150 could have been a compromise. I just, yesterday we had a uh, conversation with our ministers. Do you think there's one single minister, except the Greens, okay, the usual suspects, one single minister in the council advocating for 150? No, beyond the Greens, there is none. And most of them are at 300 or even 500, 600 livestock units. I mean, yeah, this is what, what happens in reality. Well, when we talk about fertilizers, we had these big debates in the European Parliament. Oh, yes, uh, commissioner proposed. Oh, we need now to support uh, the, the, the producers of fertilizers. Well, they had windfall profits of billions, but, but never mind. Let's support them. We need to support farmers to use more artificial fertilizer because the prices were so high half a year ago that the prices are back down where, where they were. Nobody cared. We need extra subsidies. Oh, it's not from cap money. We need additional money than cap money to keep the fertilizer, the artificial fertilizer strategy running. While we all know how how uh, nature, nature, close to nature farming works, we all know what the alternatives are. So don't get me wrong, but uh, for me, my daily fight is to put a spotlight on what is actually going on, to put a spotlight on how we are financing the disaster with taxpayers' money, and rather find ways to, to stop that wherever possible. And first we need to stop that, and then, unfortunately, we can start to rebuild. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Monsieur Weitz, pour euh, cette intervention euh, puissante. Et je pense que euh, c'est intéressant qu'on soit une diversité d'acteurs ici pour l'entendre. Euh, je passe maintenant la parole à Madame Hatz euh, de, du Comité économique et social.
Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, this invitation to speak here. Uh, I have to say uh, thank you for the previous speaker. I have to agree a lot of the points that are made. Just to give you a little bit context, I'm a farmer myself coming from Estonia, uh, which has actually uh, one of the highest uh, uh, percentage of uh, concentration of uh, agricultural land in uh, Europe. Because of our history, I'm not giving you a histor historical uh, lecture here, but uh, probably most of you know. But I set up my farm in 2018 from the zero. Uh, being a young farmer today, I'm 35, uh, 36. <laughs> Sorry, 36, but uh, still considered as a young, uh, young farmer. Uh, yes, and uh, setting up a farm uh, from the zero, uh, I am uh, managing uh, almost 90% of uh, my land is rented out from, uh, uh, from the landowners. I respect the private ownership, but I still uh, see that this is a very, very, very uh, big concern for my farm because in Estonia we don't have any securities for uh, farming, uh, uh, renting a farm for agriculture purposes. So that means that it uh, can take uh, one year or 10 years. Uh, it depends on the uh, owner of the farm. But uh, coming to this, uh, to, to this debate, um, I would like to say that the European Economic and Social Committee has always been at the forefront of foster more sustainable food system and considers that the agri-food system would benefit from the new framework to produce, process, distribute and sell healthier and more sustainable food with fairer prices. The European Economic and Social Committee therefore welcomes the initiative of the European Commission to develop a framework legislation for a sustainable EU food systems. At the production level, the European Economic and Social Committee considers that farming inherently depends on conserving natural resources for its development, while it can be at the same time actively involved in combating global warming and contribute to the tra transition to sustainable food systems. The European Economic and Social Committee considers that agroecology is the horizon towards which European agriculture should work. <coughs> Building on fully developed models such as, just, such as organic farming, permaculture and other traditional small farming systems, commitments to moving towards fewer inputs, revitalizing soils, introducing a variety of crops and protecting diversity must be encouraged and highlighted. I take this opportunity to refer to the European Union's organic awards that the European Economic Social Committee is co-organizing with the European Commission and other partners, for which the second edition will be launched later this month. The European Economic and Social Committee considers that fair food prices that reflects uh, the true cost of production for environment and society are the only way to achieve sustainable food systems uh, in the long term. The European Union and Member States should take action to ensure that farming prices stay above the cost of production and that healthier diets become more readily accessible. Sort circuits and change the added value and profitability of small farms, enabling them to sell identified products that have a story to tell to consumers and generate community activity and social links in rural areas, improvements in food production quality and marketing channels, Kim consumers' responsibility in relations to the value of food and the waste, and therefore contribute to a reduction in the impact of food and climate change. There is a wealth of short supply chains initiative based on a social organization and a regional innovation, which are still in the process of being set up. Many studies highlight the local dimension and collective identity as a key factor in long-term sustainability. The challenge is, is therefore to empower operators to create local food systems based on local governance, which is representative of these operators. The European Economic and Social Committee has acknowledged the increasing number of initiatives being implemented at the regional and local levels to support alternative the alternative uh, food systems. The initiatives establish closer links between producers and consumers, create opportunities for local businesses and new jobs, and reconnect communities with their food. The European Economic and Social Committee also highlights the role of cities in developing more integrated food policies. 
At the European Union level, the Europe uh, European Economic and Social Committee proposes the creation of European Food Policy Council, bringing together the main actors that can unite behind the objective of moving towards food sustainability. Such a council would help achieve a more integrated and participatory approach to food policy making. The European Economic and Social Committee is currently developing an own initiative opinion on this proposal. The European Economic and Social Committee repeat the importance of investing in education on sustainable diets from an early age to help young people appreciate the value of food. Special attention must be paid to vulnerable groups, especially people with low incomes. Thank you very much again for giving me the floor and I'm looking forward to other interventions and discussions. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour ces trois interventions. Euh, je pense qu'on a un cadre très clair à la discussion maintenant et aussi une très bonne introduction au, au débat qui suit. Euh, donc euh, le débat suivant, avant d'essayer de, de faire un, un petit échange, un petit débat si on a le temps, mais à vrai dire, il sera relativement court. Le débat suivant euh, porte donc sur euh, la question des prix, des marchés et de la souveraineté alimentaire. Nous avons donc trois euh, orateurs, oratrices, et Alessandra Turco, Turco euh, donc euh, paysanne italienne, euh, membre de l'organisation ARI en Italie euh, et représentante de CVC aujourd'hui. Ensuite, nous avons euh, le membre du Parlement, Benoît Bito. Merci beaucoup d'être là, représentant des Verts euh, et paysan également. <rire> et, et donc, à nouveau, Monsieur Peter Schmidt, euh, représentant euh, du Comité économique et social européen et donc président de la section NAT. Merci, euh, merci à vous trois d'être ici et je donc, te donne la parole, Alessandra. Ok. Gracias uh, Emma, uh, gracias a todos los ponentes que acaban de hablar. Yo soy italiana, voy a hablar uh, en español y <ríe> así para dar un poco de movimiento a, a este juego de los idiomas. Uh, soy campesina en Italia y cuando me soy instalada en Italia era una joven campesina, son 11 años y he parado de ser joven no por edad, más por consumción, se diría en Italia, o sea, por cansamiento después de cinco años de trabajo, creo. Eh, recibo, tengo seis hectáreas, mmm, practico una agricultura muy diversificada y con esta hectáreas recibo 256 euros de PAC que me sirven más o menos para pagar quien me gestiona la práctica para recibir la PAC. Entonces, eso para <ríe> así contextualizar un poco respecto a quién, a quién somos. Entonces, frente a todos estos uh, problemas que se han presentado, que son problemas uh, uh, y dificultades que encontramos a nivel local, nacional, internacional y global, y entonces, uh, haciendo una visión más uh, enfocada a lo que son los mercados internacionales y la globalización y los tratados de libre comercio, nosotros los campesinos y las campesinas lo que es, encontramos, uh, que nos encontramos haciendo es de actuar prácticas de resistencia. Entonces, hemos tenido que elaborar sistemas de producción y distribución que vayan reduciendo el utilizo de insumos externos y que pongan en valor los recursos naturales, los conocimientos tradicionales y las relaciones. Entonces, hemos tenido que implementar nuestra posibilidad y capacidad de resistir. Y, lo, y esto es lo que no permite aún hoy de imaginar por Europa un modelo de soberanía alimentaria. El modelo campesino agroecológico, por, por medio de nuestra propia resiliencia, no ha permitido de desarrollar esas alternativas que eh, Genevieve acaba de, de encuadrar por medio de nuestro manifiesto pero no podemos quedarnos resistiendo por toda la vida. Necesitamos un cambio real y un cambio efectivo. Elementos fundamentales de este cambio, como ya han dicho otros compañeros aquí presentes, son los instrumentos de regulación del mercado. Entonces, para que sea posible recuperar la soberanía, la posibilidad de soberanía alimentaria por Europa, no se puede aceptar que Europa sea el primer importador de frutas y verduras. O sea, cuando tenemos la posibilidad de producir comida fresca y de calidad en el entorno de nuestras ciudades, 
Eso no se puede aceptar. Necesitamos llegar a tener mucho campesino, mucha campesina en los territorios. Necesitamos recuperar las regulaciones de mercado que han sido destruidas. Entonces, a nivel mundial, en frente a, al, al cuadro internacional, la Unión Europea tiene que recuperar su capacidad de decidir sobre su propia política agrícola y alimentaria. No puede ser el mercado que va gobernando la Unión Europea. Hablamos que los precios, como acaba de presentar uh, nuestra, uh, la, la agricultora de, de, de Estonia, uh, los precios deben reflejar los costes de producción. En el marco de los objetivos de los sistemas alimentarios sostenibles del Pacto Verde, en el marco de la estrategia de la granja a la mesa. Hablamos que los precios de la exportación e importación deben respetar estos costes en origen y en destino, o sea, en la Unión Europea y en los países de destino y al revés. Necesitamos una producción que sea basada en la sostenibilidad social y medioambiental, a donde para nosotros la sostenibilidad y la capacidad de replicarse en el tiempo sin dañar los elementos del sistema y según un camino que tiene que estar en equilibrio estable entre los insumos y los recursos. Entonces, necesitamos de un modelo campesino agroecológico. Las producciones tienen que contemplar mecanismos de regulación de la producción para prevenir excesos o para que sean posibles mayores niveles de, demanda, de responder a mayores niveles de demanda, de demanda alimentaria. Respecto a eso, tenemos que recordar, por ejemplo, que a mayor exportaciones siempre corresponden mayor importaciones. Y entonces eso lo vemos en el caso de la fruta y de las verduras, a donde tenemos un, un balance negativo de 37 mil millones de dólares respecto a la compra de estos alimentos. Queremos destacar que en los países que tienen sistemas agrícolas, agrícolas menos industrializados, gastan menos en insumos. Entonces, que el peso de los consumos intermedios, por ejemplo, por Italia, es del 43%, el de Alemania es del 73%. Entonces, en estas situaciones de elevado coste, se pierden la rentabilidad y las eficiencias. Y los ingresos de la producción tienen que ser complementados por la intervención pública. Otro factor que queremos destacar es que la renta agraria por unidad de trabajador agrícola aumenta a medida que disminuye el número de los trabajadores. Entonces notamos que en el 2021 el aumento de la renta agrícola y de la remuneración de los factores ha correspondido a un aumento de la explotación laboral y del tiempo laboral por la familia campesina. Y entonces hemos tenido que trabajar más, o sea, <ríe> más que el resto del mundo, cosa que pasa muchísimas veces. Y entonces podemos ver entre los datos que por el 23.5% de las personas que trabajan en agricultura trabajan más horas que la proporción media de las personas empleadas. Y este monto de horas es por lo menos de 49 horas por semana. Entonces, pasando a otro nivel de regulación que vamos pidiendo, es el nivel de la, de, de, de la regulación interior a la Unión Europea. Entonces, ahí tal vez también los precios están en la base. Entonces, los precios de esta producción y alimentación tienen que ser basados sobre ese modelo. O sea, tienen que uh, pagar lo que son los costes de producción. Entonces, se necesita una gobernanza de las ofertas de productos y servicios para la producción agrícola, donde dominan empresas con posición de casi monopolio. Esto es imprescindible para incorporar de nueva persona a la agricultura y para que la producción sea más distribuida en todos los territorios de la Unión Europea. Necesitamos una regulación a nivel coherente de los diferentes territorios. Cuando hablamos de regulación de mercado interior, nos referimos tanto a la cuestión de los precios como a la producción. Entonces, sobre el precio, existe una oportunidad, oportunidad real con la Directiva Europea sobre las prácticas desleales. Esta tiene una actuación, por ejemplo, en la Ley de España sobre el funcionamiento del mercado, que recoge que obligatoriamente los precios para cada parte de la cadena deban incluir los costes de producción. Y entonces, comenzando por los productores. Este es un avance y debe ampliarse a toda la Unión Europea. 
Junto a eso, se deben articular medidas para evitar, evitar excedentes o responder a una mayor demanda interior de productos, que sean de calidad adecuada y que tengan precios que, que, ren, que rendan posible la accesibilidad para todos y todas. Sobre la producción, necesitamos abordar una redistribución de la producción, de, desde las grandes explotaciones o macrogranjas de modelos industrial, hacia favorecer la incorporación de más personas a la agricultura y de los pequeños agricultores, y liberar el mercado de estas grandes producciones agroindustriales. Entonces, deberá existir una regulación europea de granjas y fincas, en definitiva, que permita esta tipología de producción. El control del proceso de producción tiene que estar basado en el modelo de producción que tiene en su base la agricultura campesina agroecológica. Sobre la regulación de los mercados y la redistribución de los productos, no queremos descartar la, territoriz la territorialización y eventuales cuotas o límites territoriales de producción. Entonces, se tienen que evitar la concentración y favorecer la redistribución de la producción. No, no tenemos que olvidar que si queremos incorporar más jóvenes o personas a la agricultura, si queremos que las mujeres sigan viviendo y trabajando en el campo, debemos garantizar precios que paguen el trabajo del agricultor, sin la necesidad de diversificar los ingresos de los agricultores proveyendo servicios. Esto no será suficiente sin acoplar la prestación de servicio por las áreas rurales y entonces toda esta parte de infraestructuras, de escuelas, de transporte, de salud, así como infraestructura por la producción agrícola, que puedan apoyar en la producción, transformación y venta de los productos. Entonces, carreteras, mercado de proximidad, servicios locales para la transformación de la producción agrícola, o por el caso, por ejemplo, de la cría de animales, los mataderos por animales de finca. Entonces, nosotros queremos que la PAC tenga que, revisar, tenga que ser revisada para que su núcleo sea la regulación del mercado y no los pagos directos que compensan la caída de los precios. Entonces, todo el mundo tiene por ganar en este proceso de recuperación de instrumentos de regulación. Queremos que se actúe en la política que pueden garantizar una vida digna por los pequeños y medianos campesinos europeos, por los y las trabajadores de la tierra, que permitan a la población de acceder a una alimentación sana y de calidad, que el equilibrio agroambiental no permita de seguir viviendo y produciendo en nuestro entorno. Estamos pidiendo políticas que, se, que ya se efectuaron y que ya se utilizaron y que ya funcionaron. Entonces, antes del 92 había cuota de producción. Nosotros somos gente del campo, somos muy concretos. Lo que pedimos son decisiones políticas. Merci beaucoup, Alessandra, pour ces demandes très claires. Je vais maintenant passer la parole à M. Benoît Biteau. Merci, Emma. Euh, avant d'engager mon propos, je vais, je vais relayer ce qu'a dit Geneviève tout à l'heure, c'est-à-dire que je suis avec vous parce que le sujet est d'importance, mais euh, nous devrions être dans les rues en France pour euh, dénoncer la casse sociale que nous propose le gouvernement français actuellement, et notamment sur la retraite, et les paysans sont aussi concernés par cette casse sociale. Nous sommes deux ou trois ou quatre Français ici dans la salle, c'est parce que le sujet est important, mais... C'est important de manifester notre solidarité à ceux qui sont là-bas en train de, de, de préserver les acquis sociaux très importants en France. Je ne peux pas débuter complètement euh, mon propos sur euh, la régulation des marchés euh, sans faire une analyse un peu de ce qui s'est dit euh, juste avant. J'ai cru au début de, de cet échange que la Via Campesina avait gagné la bagarre, que la Commission entendait... Euh, depuis, de, 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 depuis toutes ces années, ce que réclame la Via Campesina quand j'ai entendu le plaidoyer de notre commissaire Janusz Wojciechowski sur l'intérêt des structures paysannes, des structures familiales. Et tout se gâte au moment où il nous dit que euh, c'est grâce à la PAC qu'on va réussir à faire ça, grâce à une, paraît-il, nouvelle PAC, je m'adresse aux représentants de la commission, qui n'a rien de nouveau. À quel moment est-ce qu'on va inverser des tendances lourdes quand on continue de distribuer des aides par unité de surface, dont on comprend parfaitement le mécanisme, plus on a d'hectares, plus on a d'aides. Et comme l'a dit mon, mon, mon ami Thomas, même pas de plafonnement, ce qui fait que c'est les grosses structures qui, en, qui engrangent euh, les volumes. Et je vous donne un chiffre, 80% de la PAC captée par 20% des grosses structures agricoles. Et on nous fait un plaidoyer remarquable, j'étais presque ému, hein, euh, sur euh, euh, la force de... de, de, de des structures paysannes et familiales, alors que rien dans cette PAC 
parce qu'elle n'est pas nouvelle, parce qu'on n'a rien changé dans le, dans le cœur du réacteur, ne va permettre de venir en aide de ces structures familiales et paysannes. Donc il faut se le dire, donc oui, M. Janusz Wojciechowski, vous avez raison quand vous parlez des de, 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 et, et vous défendez euh, les structures paysannes et, euh, et, 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 euh, et familiales, mais, mais non, cette PAC ne viendra pas les aider. Il faut qu'on qu soit clair sur le diagnostic. Ensuite, sur un plaidoyer aussi sur la stratégie de la ferme à la fourchette. Bien sûr que nous, les écologistes, on est favorables à la stratégie de la ferme à la fourchette. Bien sûr qu'on l'a voté. Mais encore une fois, ne venons pas dire que c'est la PAC qui va avancer sur ce sujet-là. On nous parle des éco-régimes. Oui, je vais faire vite. On nous parle des éco-régimes. Oui. On, on nous parle des éco-régimes, mais, mais remettons les choses en perspective. C'est quoi les éco-régimes C'est 25% de la PAC. Ça veut dire que les 75 autres pourcents ne sont pas conditionnés, ou par très peu de choses. Et que ces 25% sont là pour, euh, paraît-il, euh, nous permettre d'atteindre les, les ambitions de la stratégie de la ferme à la fourchette. Soyons sérieux. D'autant plus qu'il n'y a aucune ambition dans ces éco-régimes. Le ministre de l'Agriculture en France s'adresse aux agriculteurs et leur dit « ne vous inquiétez pas ». Pour 80% d'entre vous, sans rien changer, sans rien changer, vous allez valider les éco-régimes. Ça en dit long sur l'ambition des éco-régimes. Et c'est avec ça qu'on devrait atteindre euh, des ambitions à 50% de réduction des pesticides, des antibiotiques, 20% d'engrais de, de synthèse en moins et 25% de l'agriculture biologique en 2030. Alors que la France d'ailleurs affiche en 2027 que 18%. Ça va même être le boulet de l'ambition des 25% en 2030 parce que c'est le plus grand pays euh, agricole européen. Mais j'en arrête là sur euh, mes ressentis. Thomas a fait une brillante intervention, je ne vais pas euh, euh, marcher sur ses plates-bandes, mais je voulais compléter et donner quand même mon ressenti. Euh, je trouve que le tour de passe-passe, qui consiste à nous dire qu'on a besoin des structures familiales et paysannes, et, et, et juste derrière nous dire que c'est la PAC qui va réussir, était un peu trop gros pour que je le laisse sous silence. En ce qui concerne euh, la régulation des marchés, il faut d'abord partir d'un postulat, celui qui consiste à dire qu'il n'y aura pas de transition agroécologique juste sans régulation forte des marchés et du commerce international. C'est le postulat de départ. Si on n'a pas compris ça, on est tout de suite à côté de la plaque. Sur le commerce international, dans la dernière réforme de la PAC, qui paraît-il est merveilleuse, euh, on avait l'opportunité de l'ouverture d'un débat sur la question des fameuses mesures miroirs. Magnifique, tous on est d'accord, sauf que Malheureusement, la discussion a été bloquée, encore une fois par le dogmatisme de la, de la Commission, sur les règles de l'OMC, l'Organisation Mondiale du Commerce. Pourtant, les rapports produits par la même Commission, c'est là où ça devient croustillant, mais quand on est député européen, on vit dans un nouveau pays qui s'appelle la paradoxie. Euh, c'est la loi du plus fort qui a gagné, c'est-à-dire que, les, les rapports nous disent que la, la, par, par la Commission elle-même que, que la mise en place de mesures miroirs est possible et que ça permet de respecter les règles de l'OMC. Mais on a balayé l'hypothèse en disant que ce n'est pas possible à cause de l'OMC. Donc voyez un peu le, le, la situation. Ensuite, il faut quand même intégrer que ces règles, qu'il faut changer de façon urgente, sont héritées d'un autre siècle. Et que le multilatéralisme qui d'ailleurs siège normalement aux discussions au sein de l'Organisation mondiale du commerce, est indispensable. Et c'est précisément parce que ce multilatéralisme est en panne qu'on voit émerger euh, des échanges euh, bilatéraux comme euh, euh, les accords de libre-échange avec le Mercosur, euh, avec euh, le CETA, le TAFTA, enfin voilà, je ne vais pas faire la liste de tous ces accords de libre-échange, c'est précisément parce que ce multilatéralisme est, par est, est parfaitement en panne et donc il faut absolument euh, le relancer. Ensuite, euh, la discussion européenne sur la question de la régulation de, de la production. Alors je vais parler d'un gros mot, je vais, je vais le lâcher, les quotas. Ça c'est un gros mot quand on discute de la PAC, euh, c'est devenu tabou, et pourtant, même si ceux qui avaient été mis en place sont sûrement perfectibles, c'est un moyen de réguler euh, la, la, la production pour éviter que les revenus des paysans soient en berne, et pour éviter que tout repose, y compris notre sécurité alimentaire, sur les échanges à l'échelon mondiaux. D'autant plus que ces quotas participent aussi à une régulation écologique de l'agriculture et, et donc participent à ce que cette agriculture soit au rendez-vous de l'histoire sur les enjeux du climat, de la biodiversité et de la santé, qui est souvent, euh, trop souvent oubliée. Les quotas de, de demain donc, euh, pourraient correspondre à des, aux capacités écologiques de la production, mais Geneviève en a déjà parlé, mais c'est la question de l'élevage par exemple. C'est-à-dire que l'élevage, 
euh, loin de, de moi l'idée, je suis moi-même éleveur, euh, loin, de, loin de moi l'idée de, de, de remettre en cause l'intérêt de l'élevage, mais l'élevage joue un rôle important dans les équilibres écologiques. Bien sûr que nous devons lutter sur les élevages, euh, contre les élevages industriels et concentrationnaires. Il n'y a plus de débat là-dessus. Mais la mise en place des quotas, précisément, peuvent être un outil pour lutter contre ces élevages industriels et concentrationnaires. Et donc, aujourd'hui, quand on parle de ce sujet-là, la Commission, par exemple, euh, on a juste dit un gros mot. Euh, la régulation... Euh, importante des marchés financiers. On le voit bien aujourd'hui. Euh, je crois que c'est Geneviève aussi qui a parlé des, des engrais. On voit bien qu'aujourd'hui, on relance... Non, c'est Thomas. On relance euh, l'acquisition la, 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 d'engrais. On continue de penser que l'agriculture passe par euh, l'utilisation massive des engrais. Et on libère des fonds publics pour financer les grandes entreprises qui produisent des engrais qui pourraient être concernées par les super profits euh, liés à la crise de l'énergie et liés à, au conflit en Ukraine. On voit bien que l'agroécologie n'est pas dans les radars des politiques publiques euh, qu'on qu 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 est en train d'imaginer aujourd'hui. Alors que quand on regarde ce que font euh, les agriculteurs qui se revendiquent de l'agroécologie, ils proposent aussi des moyens, et c'est compatible avec la stratégie de la ferme à la fourchette, de réduction, voire de, 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 de disparition de l'utilisation des engrais de synthèse. Eh bien non, on met l'argent public sur la continuation des mauvaises réponses. Et enfin, euh, sur l'alimentation... Euh, un récent rapport de, de l'IPES montre très bien le lien qu'il y a entre crise alimentaire et crise de la dette dans les, pays, euh, dans les pays à faible revenu. Tout le monde parle de solidarité. Il faut qu'on utilise plus de pesticides pour produire plus, pour être solidaire avec l'Égypte, avec l'Afrique du Nord, pour les nourrir. Il faut retourner les jachères et faire en sorte que sur les jachères, on produise pour nourrir ces gens-là. Juste encore un chiffre. Les jachères en Europe, 2,6%. Gain de production avec le retournement des jachères, 0,4%. J'ose espérer, pour eux, pour les Égyptiens, pour les Africains du Nord, qu'on va les nourrir avec autre chose qu'un gain de production de 0,4%, sans compter que sur ces jachères, on héberge euh, de la biodiversité, des pollinisateurs qui participent à la production agricole et qui disparaissent avec le retournement des jachères. Et donc, moi, mon inquiétude, c'est l'inverse, c'est que, est-ce que ce retournement des jachères ne va pas provoquer au contraire une baisse de la production sur la globalité de la production européenne. Mais pourtant, c'est acté par la Commission. Donc, vous voyez bien qu'il euh, y a quand même un, 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 un biais cognitif euh, chez ces gens qui nous parlent de souveraineté alimentaire et qui n'en ont pas lu, je pense, la définition proposée par la Via Campesina, qui d'ailleurs n'est pas invitée au débat agricole. Euh, c'est un petit clin d'œil quand même. Moi, j'aime beaucoup euh, les avis d'experts qu'on nous propose en Commission agricole où systématiquement le COPA et la COGK est invité. Mais la Via Campesina, je, sauf euh, erreur de ma part, Emma, mais je n'ai pas l'impression qu'ils soient considérés comme experts. Et pourtant, j'ai entendu un magnifique plaidoyer du commissaire sur euh, l'intérêt euh, des fermes paysannes et familiales. Malheureusement, euh, quand il s'agit des débats euh, entre guillemets sérieux, euh, euh, on, on oublie euh, la Via Campesina. Et donc, ce problème de solidarité, ce n'est pas produire plus, c'est aussi réguler les marchés financiers de manière, j'ai fini, de manière à ce que cette solidarité se traduise aussi par une solidarité qui permette de donner la capacité à ceux qui ont faim, à ceux qui ont difficulté à accès à la nourriture, de sortir de ces logiques financières et de pouvoir leur permettre d'accéder euh, à la nourriture à des tarifs euh, et à des, à des niveaux de prix euh, accessibles pour eux. Et, et, et juste une petite parenthèse, elle est très courte, tout ça est amplifié par une instrumentalisation du contexte géopolitique en Ukraine, de la sécheresse cet été, pour relancer, remettre en selle euh, le modèle agricole qui précisément, les pratiques agricoles qui précisément, nous rendent extrêmement vulnérables. Einstein disait, c'est pas avec ceux qui sont à l'origine des problèmes qu'on va trouver la solution. Merci beaucoup, M. Pito, pour cette intervention. Je passe directement la parole à M. Schmitt. Pour le ESC. Merci, merci Emma, il était allemand. Hein. <rire> <rire> um, yeah, what remains? I mean, after these speeches, so the last speaker, that's always nice not to say what not has been already said by all the speakers. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, for me always um, a pleasure to do it because I will 
reiterate everything what you have been hear heard, because when we leave the room, then we ask you, what did you hear today? So in order to know whether it, it, it arrived you or not, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's a task now for me to do, uh, in a way. The question is, <clears throat> we, do, we do know all, all points. We have heard it today from all of the speakers. We know what is to be done in order to come to a sustainable, fair food system. And the question is why it doesn't work. I mean, everyone, would, everyone says in all the meetings, in all the debates, in all the interventions, we always hear, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, we have to change. Remember, well, we produced here in the house a lot of opinions. You can read all that, what we have heard uh, today. We, we described it also as civil society, not only as, as, uh, as Via Campesina or different other groups. We described every single point on it. And the question is, why doesn't it work? Why? And the answer is that simple. Because it's about interests. It's not about shaping framing policies. It's not about that, because we know what we should do. But no, ask people on the ground. It's easy to find solutions to do it. It is about interest, simply interest. And you expressed it, and Thomas and others expressed it, that we have a food supply chain within stakeholders, within the players, earn a lot of money give you a couple of figures. Uh, people knowing me know that um, this is for me a point which I uh, like very much to talk about. So when we talk about food prices and we talk about value in the food supply chain, so it's the retailer, it was mentioned, it's the multinationals and uh, Geneviève and Dandoni, when you were in this committee, I used already this example when we have a look at it. So the big multinationals in the food supply chain, you know what, what profit they have on the turnover? the big multinationals. Talk about Danone, um, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Nestle, Mondelez, all the big one, the big players in them. Do you know? Do you have an idea? Ask the commission. Do you have an idea what the profit on the turnover of these companies is about? It's about 20% on the turnover, not on the investment. It's not talking about return on investment. You can't, even Excel is not able to give you a feedback if you put this into an Excel sheet, what, how much money this is in the end of the day. And talking about the interest, it's, uh, it's a pity that we do not have more policymakers here, asking, in, look into the transparency register. How many, how many contacts do you have on a daily basis with the people like here, sitting here in the room, with the civil society groups, with the trade unions, and with all other actors in the system. And when we look into the transparency register, then we have 75, 74, sorry, percent of the commission are business contacts. The rest is for us to share. Farmers, trade unionists, consumers, NGOs, and I don't know what kind of, of organizations we have. I mean, this is the answer, because the Commission is following simply the interests of the industry, and that's it. So the only way, the only way to overcome is to push, the only way to, is, is to clarify that we are not accepting this way any longer. And that goes through the fight, through the political fight. There is no other way to, to, to do it. And remember when we had the farm to fork, I was quite saying I was quite happy to see that the Commission took the idea on the farm to fork. I studied in this morning to say that we drafted uh, the comprehensive food policy for Europe. Um, but then it came, as you mentioned, Benoit, then it came the, the common agriculture policy. So this was, my, this was my, you know, my indication to you not to speed up, but the question is, does it, is it coherent? And we had a meeting after, no, you remember, we had a meeting and we asked you, so, how does it work? How does it square? On the one hand, we have a farm to fork. On the other hand, we have a, we have a comprehensive food policy, which doesn't, doesn't reflect at all all the findings out of the farm to fork strategy. Why? Because it's totally disconnected when the council is sitting down 
and they've, they negotiate with the member states on issues what the Commission has, 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 uh, has proposed in the end, which is a good approach, and we fully agree here also, Benoit, as you, as you already mentioned. So, and <clears throat> all these actors, and to give you one example, and I have to speed up, I know, one example where we have to look at it, and this is indeed the issue that in some cases you, you must use crisis in order to show what is the reality. We uh, produced a paper recently, and uh, uh, Joseph was uh, also a member of the study group. I was rapporteur. Joseph was, uh, was, uh, was the president of the study group. We produced a paper on the food speculation in the aftermath of the Ukraine war. And when you, and when you talk to the people, everyone said, say, will say to you, yeah, but this is not okay. If we're going to speculate on food, this is not okay. So we can speculate on everything else, but on food is not okay. We deep dive into this subject. I don't know whether you read it, this paper already. We're going to send it to you. And I must confess, I was, I was, I was even me, was quite surprised what is going under the radar uh, globally on food speculation. And then we invited different actors and different policy makers. We also invited the Commission. And it is evident, and we have to we have to see four players globally have more than 80% of the, of, the, of the trade, of the global trade on, on food commodities in their hands. Four. I mean, not, not 40, not 400, not 4,000, four globally can decide where and when they provide food to people who are, are starving and dying in Africa or in other countries. Four. And the Commission told us there is no evidence of a misuse of a misuse of, uh, of speculative activities. I mean, come on. So I, I, it's not necessary to be a scientist that we know if we have four people or four organizations or four companies having the power, knowing more than the global, the global community together, knowing more than the FIO and all states in the world on information, on trade, that they won't miss, they won't misuse it. Sorry, this is more than naive. It was not DG Agri, no? to be clear. <laughs> I mean, it was not DG Agri, but you know, from DG Finance. And that's the point. These are the people, they want to have the free market. They do not care about peasants. They do not care about farmers. They just simply make a market and consider, as we heard today, food is a commodity and land is a commodity and everything has to be finalized through the people having enough money and to grab it and to deal with the food. So, Joseph knows it better. 95% of coffee trade is not linked to coffee. 95% is, is dealing in the casino. Last year, yeah. In the casino. They just play in the casino. Only 5% is linked to the food. I have a look at the time. I have to, to, I have to, I have to conclude. Sorry, that's, it's always the last speaker. It's always, it's always squeezed. Uh, so it's, al it's always squeezed no, no, <laughs> in, a, in a position. Colleagues uh, and friends, the, the only way to overcome is we have to address, we have to fight, we have to come together in a, solidari in a, solidari uh, in a solidarity action because there is no other way to, uh, to target policymakers, that we tell them that we, the citizens, are no longer following these policies which, is, which goes on the back of people, of farmers, and of citizens. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Schmidt. And sorry for cutting you. Sorry to all of you, actually, to, to cut you a bit. But then I give the word already to Mr. Ricard Ramon, uh, Deputy Head of uh, Unit A1. Uh, of DJ Agri. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, first of all, thanks uh, to Via Campesin and the uh, uh, European Economic and Social Committee for, for this interesting event, and uh, which was a pleasure to follow uh, the, whole, the whole morning. Uh, first of all, the Commission had to leave, uh, and he missed some of the interventions, and I can, I can, I can assure you that uh, my work this afternoon is to transmit and to inform properly, and and I will pass the messages, uh, the messages which I think 
were very clear uh, uh, across the across the different interventions this morning. So, so uh, be sure that Commissioner Wojciechowski he will be he will be informed uh, about uh, all your interventions and also, by the way, the comments also about his intervention. <laughs> and uh, because many of the interventions referred also to the to the to the first uh, to the first speeches. So that's the first uh, thing. I'm not going since you had the Commissioner here uh, for the half of the morning. I'm not going to enter now into into a, a political discussion eh? and uh, but i think that um, but i would like to clarify at least at least i will not i would not be able to leave this room without clarifying at least two things uh, first and and uh, and because there were some references eh, to the fact that via campesina was not included in some dialogues that that commission had ignored via campesina and i think this is wrong and and Commission, and I think you all know that precisely this commission has given to Eva Campesina a role in many forums that never happened before. And I would like to say here today in front of you because I don't think it's fair to accuse commission for this uh, for an unfair treatment to Via Campesina when precisely in the last years we have given voice in some of the, our, our forums eh, and uh, some of your members up front in the main discussions like the one we have, DG Agri, every year in December. And the civil dialogue groups, um, in the civil dialogue groups, uh, precisely now in the new setup, uh, in the new setup where there are no seats and no number of seats, precisely via Campesina, now you, you are at the same level as other uh, EU, -wide, uh, EU wide organizations. And I think that's important. I wanted to say that quite up front from the beginning. And I also would like to say, also, since there were some criticisms to them, to the to the message before of the commissioner i would like to say also now also openly that uh, probably i mean it was a long time and i've been here in this house for many years and i'm so many commissioners and uh, and i and uh, it's 20 years i mean the in the eu bubble and uh, probably we had never had uh, for many years uh, many years um, a, com a commissioner uh, so vocal and so willing uh, with a strong willingness to really support the, the small farms, uh, the small and medium farms uh, in Europe. And I think that's important to clarify here now. A second element, and um, on the cap, I'm not going to discuss uh, on the cap. Eh? We would, with, and uh, with many of you, I think we spent already many years eh, talking about this common agricultural policy. But uh, but there are some things which which I don't think and. I don't think they. I don't think they are correct. And when we criticize, and I think you already had this discussion with you. I mean, if we criticize the model of the support, which is very legitimate, and 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 it's true that we have a model which has uh, which has some distortions. And of course, if we have a model that based on land, because every single euro, not just. 25% as said before. No, no, no. If you, we have some figures by the way published last, last December. In fact, it's only 19% of the money of the cap is not linked to conditionality requirements, eh? which are some particular investments in the second pillar. But the rest of the, the rest of the cap, and this I would like to insist, 81% eh? of all the money of the cap is linked to the to respect at least some environmental and climate uh, requirements, and this is why. Uh, most of the money at the end of the day, indeed, is based on land, and that has been up to now the best tool and most efficient tool to guarantee, on the one hand, support to income, and at the same time to require some environmental uh, requirements to land in Europe. And thanks to this system, thanks to this system, 90% of the European, 80%, sorry, 80% of the used agricultural surface in Europe needs to respect some environmental requirements. If you have an idea any proposal eh, of another model where we can support income and also support uh, and also support environment tell us and we are ready to discuss eh, and we can uh, but tell us if is the model of the americans maybe is the model of uh, brazil new zealand um, uh, australia so tell us so tell us today in the world <laughs> which system is more effective more effective in supporting income and at the same time providing environment but this I mean, I don't think it's a discussion for today. But what I would like also to say is that the 80-20 reference, which is there, yeah, and we, we never denied that, eh? the 80% of the, of, the, of, the, of, of, the, of the resources that go to the 20%, uh, this indeed is linked 
to the thing which you discussed at the very beginning of this uh, seminar, which is land uh, ownership. In fact, it's the ownership at the end of the day, and it's the different structures, the ones that define, define that, that. But, and I would like at least to point one element, when we make the 80-20 discussion, which is true, and this is why my commissioner said before that this time, for the first time, we have a compulsory requirement, a compulsory requirement to all member states to at least 10% of the money to be relocated in order precisely to, to, to turn and change the direction of this 2020 dynamic, which is not fair. We fully agree. We fully agree it's not fair. And this is why we have this redistributive mechanism, the CRIS, in our jargon, which in some countries is higher than, another, than others, but at least today in Europe, and that's in the figures also we published, 10% of the, of the resources are relocated. You can tell us and, and that maybe it's not enough, 10%, probably, probably. And in fact, we as a commission in the discussions, in the trialogues we had, we also tried to, to increase that as much as possible. And we got, and we got a, a political agreement with the European Parliament and the Council. That's a democratic setting we have. And we managed for the first time to force member states, even some of them didn't want it, eh? but we forced them to redistribute these 10% of the resources. And here I would like also to add, and that was one of the main messages of Commissioner Wojciechowski, defending the role of, of, of the cap, of the new cap towards the small farmers. And another element is that, I mean, when we criticized the uh, payments, and, uh, and yeah, there was, uh, there was a colleague, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Turco, no? she made her own experience, eh? and, and, and it's true that there are sectors and there are farmers eh? who, who really get a very low level, eh? and that's because of, you know, eh? some sectors get less than more, eh? and that's, that's, uh, that's been the reality, probably it's not fair, and it is changing, we think it is changing, and precisely the new cap evolves towards a much more fairer treatment. And here I would like to say one thing, when we criticize direct payments, okay, it would be good also to have, I mean, Many of you are farmers, eh? but every day we also meet, because in commission, by the way, we don't, I mean, you said that we only meet business. I can tell you that in this year, uh, commission, I can tell you that in this year, we meet more farmers than business. And uh, this I can assure you. But the, many of the farmers that come to see us eh, from many organizations, they want to keep these direct payments. Why? There are some sectors, some of the most more vulnerable sectors in Europe, and who play a role in rural areas, sheep, Goat. I don't know if we have here some producers, sheep and goat, yeah, and beef, yeah, for example, uh, dairy sector, uh, very critical sectors that we have, which really depend from our support and wh where our support is 30, 40, even 60 percent of, uh, of their income. So we think that when, and, 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 and that's the message we get precisely, the vulnerable sectors require the support and we are ready and we will continue to fight to keep it. And this I would like, I would like to insist, eh? and now we have it until 2027, secured and, and, uh, and let's hope in the future, the most vulnerable sectors and the ones who more need it, we are, will be the ones who will concentrate the support. But in any case, the, on, on the cap, it was not the main discussion uh, today, but I think, and I would like at least to announce and to the, to the members of the parliament uh, in particular and the Economic and Social Committee, we have a, a, a duty as a commission before the end of this year to come with a report to the parliament and the council to explain our view of all these cap plans, all this cap, which now is on place. Eh? So now, bucle le bucle, and okay, we finished, we finished this process in many years, and what, how do we see that? And I think that will be a good moment, this report, we are going to publish before the end of the year, precisely to see that maybe some things were good, maybe some things could be improved, of course, eh? like everything, like, and, uh, and we are ready to also have and continue this discussion. Then, um, but, all, but then going to the real discussion today, eh, which was mainly on, 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 uh, on land eh, and your big proposal on the, of, of, the, of the directive. Eh. First of all, uh, we really, as Commissioner already indicated, that we welcome the initiative. And, um, and uh, we think that this deserves really a technical discussion and, uh, and the VIA Campaign Secretary, you are invited to our offices uh, whenever you want, whenever you want to, uh, to, to discuss each of these technical aspects which we do propose, because some of the ideas are really good, and we think, and we think that there is a scope eh, to really explore eh, uh, the feasibility, uh, not only in the long term, but even in the in the short term. Eh? I think some of the previous interventions. No, I think Mrs. Carvalis, for example, she already mentioned the observatory of the rural observatory, which is a key tool we already have there. Eh? We already have there joint developed to us together with the JRC, and indeed, I mean, uh, this is uh, this is uh, this observatory is something which which is flexible, and we could uh, we could enlarge it to the quite practical way. And also on this domain on the land, I would like also to tell you that there are many things going on. 
and uh, and you did a good uh, work technically, and you you have very good references. We saw it already in your in your in your proposal, and uh, and, presi and but precisely we see that there are many things going on. For example, because if we want to do something on land. If we would like to do something eh, on land at, at EU level, first of all, we need the very first thing we need is data. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, there are always some of these discussions, these directives and regulations eh, uh, considered a bit boring, eh, which people a bit ignore, like statistical, statistical agricultural uh, statistics. Eh? We, thanks precisely to a good discussion with the Parliament and the Council last year, we managed to get at the end of the last year eh, a new regulation, which is, uh, was, was uh, formally adopted on the 23rd of November. It's the new regulation on agricultural statistics, where for the first time in history, member states are obliged by a regulation at EU level to provide to us, to Eurostat, the, the, the prices of land markets, prices of the land ownership, and also the rents. This up to now, we already had many of these prices, but it was in a very informal way. Now member states are forced to send this to Eurostat, and, and, uh, and that, by the way, first step towards a potential uh, observatory, eh, and, and to really have discussions uh, at EU level, because we need the data, we need to know what we talk, we, we need to know what we talk about, uh, and by the way, there is even the requirement also to have this at regional, at regional level, eh, because this is an element which is quite regional. I just put this example of this regulation as something to, to show you that some things are going on. And another element is that, uh, and you were there, uh, you participated in the discussions of the study we did last year, on the different regulations of, uh, of the, uh, the different member states, eh, because the, the, this is a national competence, as the commissioner explained, and, uh, and then uh, if, we want, if we see that there is a problem and there is a need, if we think there is a need to do something, it's important, first of all, also to have a common language to understand, because, I mean, the Spanish regulations on land markets, which even changes, even regional, at regional level, is very different from France and from Italy and from Netherlands, Estonia, as we, we saw before. So uh, we did a study, and that's public, and Via Campesina, you participated in the discussions, and for the ones who don't know it, it's published, eh? it was managed by us and the JRC, which is a comprehensive approach to understand these different regulations across the different member states, to have common indicators to assess eh, and to understand uh, the differences across member states. This is already published, and now we are preparing a new study, which will be for next year, precisely on one of the issues, and I think Josep put it very, very direct and very clear, the big debate we have now on land competition. Eh? Because here, in fact, in this discussion, we talk about competition for land. Eh? Because land is, an, is a limited resource, is a limited resource, as we all know, and uh, we think that it should be devoted to produce food, but there are now, uh, there are now growing pressures on other domains, eh? and um, in particular in the energy domain, and also urbanization, eh? and uh, the urbanization and, and, uh, and all the debate we have also on, on, on land ceiling, so soil ceiling. So, so next year we are going to have uh, this study, and by the way, there will be, you know, my colleagues from this environment are working also on the soil health directive, eh? which also will have an important, which the soil health directive Directive will also have an important input to this debate on the protection uh, on the protection of land. So, on these, these are the, the the few elements I wanted to raise on the on the land. Another element is that coming. Um, uh, sorry, yes. And now I fin no, and then, yeah, now I finish. I think on the land that's what I said, and it would be good to discuss, continue the discussion. Yeah, and then just to conclude. The overall discussion we had this morning, which is really interesting, here we had, if you allow me a summary, I don't know if it's for me to do it, but if I can summarize, I saw uh, big tensions that now we have in today's day-to-day -day, uh, discussions in Europe, which is two axes. Eh? We talked about uh, a, a, a conflict, tensions between dynamics which are global with strong local implications. And I think you, Josep, you said it very clearly. And, and many times the reply, the answer is strictly local. But it's true that the dynamics, and as you said, it and the markets, and you mentioned these four players, it's true. But okay, we are in a, we are in a, in a global world. And this is why, precisely, and I would like also to, to highlight this in my conclusion, I mean, it's good that we do our own reflections, our proposals and ideas, but let's not forget we are in an open, globalized world, which is changing a lot. And here, uh, you mentioned, you talked about food sovereignty. We, as a commission, we talk more and more about open strategic autonomy. And open, and indeed, food, it is one of the fundamentals, one of the pillars of the open strategic autonomy. And probably, in the next months, we saw it in the war, in this war we have, and probably in the next months, in the next years, probably, we will need to be much more assertive in protecting some, uh, some elements and being much more uh, tactical 
radical eh, and assertive eh, in this new geopolitical context, eh, where there are some big, big players, eh, big countries, you mentioned Chin, China, and, uh, but okay, we are in a world which uh, it's not the world that maybe we would like to be, eh, but probably we as the EU, we have a role there, and this is why uh, open strategic autonomy it's one uh, of the key elements where also we are reflecting in, uh, into the future. And indeed, land is a crucial limited factor which needs to be taken into account. And then, uh, last but not least, on the regulatory, because one axis was the global and local, the other axis was more regulation. You all asked, I think everybody asked more regulation. And uh, more regulation, more intervention at EU level, at the global level. Eh? And here we have an axis between regulation and markets. Eh? And you mentioned eh, some players who really, because of the, of the market orientation, or orientation, make the most eh, and get high profits. Eh? And the, this debate on regulation, this, te this tension eh, between, market, the, between markets and regulation, here this brings us to a key element and for this discussion, which is the governance. And uh, because, because we, we are also convinced that some elements require regulation, indeed. And you mentioned, by the way, the, the UTPs, eh, which was one of our biggest success last year. Eh? And I think Commission also did some good things in the last, at least some good things in the last years. And the UTPs, and even you mentioned um, my country, eh, which is one of the ones who has been a bit more, more, uh, more assertive in its implementation. This UTPs regulation is an example of something which was quite complicated and was difficult. And and probably, probably that's the trend, that's, that's, that's a path we need to continue, we need to reflect in order to get the fair price and to get a much more balanced food chain. But of course, again, but then we go, and the colleague from the Austrian Greens, he left, eh? he mentioned this very clear example uh, about the industrial emissions. He said, yeah, Commission, you did it very well, you did it very well, but now the Council rejects. Okay, but okay, let's not forget we, are in, we have a democratic system when Parliament and Council needs to, needs to agree. Eh? So uh, even if, if, as you said, we are, we, uh, we, uh, we are managed by interest, uh, even if we are managed by interest, the ones who decide at the end of the day, it's the European Parliament and Council which are elected, uh, which are elect, elected, uh, elected bodies. But here, this is why I think all these discussions on regulation and on more intervention in these markets uh, need to take into account the particularities uh, of the governance and also proper analysis and assessment and also effects and dynamics and, and collateral effects which every measure we have because some of the measures for example on market intervention somebody with us somebody with uh, was uh, calling uh, the need for quotas this i can tell you we are not going to have uh, we are not going to have uh, uh, quotas and um, and uh, but precisely because because precisely what we are saying now is that we have a problem of food security and we need to produce and we need to produce more and let's be and and, and let's be sure be be careful also when you raise some ideas also precisely in the domain uh, of uh, limiting production in any case that's a reflection to continue and uh, and as i said before uh, the the our uh, commissioner uh, commissioner Wojciechowski is ready to follow this discussion we in directorate general for agriculture and rural development we are ready to follow these discussions and and uh, you can be you can be uh, i can assure you that that it will be very important for us in in particular in the next two three years where many things will happen we need your ideas and we, we need your input Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Ramon. Euh, désolé de dépasser un peu l'heure et désolé à nos interprètes. Merci à eux d'ailleurs. Je donne le, la dernière parole à Andoni Garcia pour euh, une minute trente secondes de conclusion. <rire> Ce n'est pas une tâche facile. Ce n'était pas une tâche facile pour vous non plus. Merci. <rire> Bien, imposible, ¿no? Bueno, no, primero que, por supuesto que agradecer a todas las participaciones que, que se han hecho en, en todas las mesas, eh, al comisario y a Ricardo Ramón, como funcionario de la Comisión Europea, y también a todos los participantes que habéis estado aquí eh, presentes y los que nos están siguiendo a través de, del streaming. Eh, Sí, seguramente que ponos, a veces igual nos conformamos con, como pequeños y medianos agricultores, nos conformamos con, con pequeñas cosas eh, sabiendo que estamos resistiendo, sabemos que vamos a avanzar, sabemos eh, lo que buscamos y, y en ese sentido agradecemos la, la participación que ha tenido aquí el comisario, lo mismo que también podemos reconocer que eh, está facilitando nuestra propia interlocución institucional con, con la Comisión Europea. Y esto lo hemos dicho y, y está ahí y lo agradecemos. 
lo mismo que agradecemos también que, que se ponga encima de la mesa el objetivo de, de, de que las políticas tengan muy claramente un modelo de, de agricultura cuya base es los pequeños y medianos agricultores cultivando de una manera sostenible, pero con personas, no, no esa sostenibilidad abstracta, sino concreta, muy concreta y definida, y la agroecología como el camino. Esto es muy claro y importante. Las personas como objetivo de las políticas, no los mercados, no los intereses que sabemos que están ahí y que en este momento son los que guían las, las políticas eh, que, por desgracia, pues tienen sus, sus efectos y aquí eh, los hemos eh, contado. Nuestro objetivo como, como SBC en este, en este encuentro está, era presentar nuestras alternativas, presentar nuestras eh, propuestas. Estamos trabajando, vamos a seguirlo haciendo. Contamos con todas vosotras y vosotros, con el Comité Económico y Social, también con la Comisión Europea, con los europarlamentarios que habéis estado aquí. También agradecer vuestra participación y, por supuesto, nuestra interlocución objetivo con el Parlamento Europeo. Y tenemos por delante muchos retos que vamos a abordarlos con toda la fuerza, porque creemos que mientras que hay lucha, hay esperanza. Así que con esto cerramos. Viva la vía campesina, globalicemos la lucha, globalicemos la esperanza. Ça marche. Euh, il y a une proposition de faire une photo générale pour toutes les personnes qui sont ici devant un des drapeaux de la Via Campesina que Ivan, euh, là-bas, va nous sortir de quelque part. <coughs> voilà. There is a, a proposal to make a general photo with all the participants here in front of uh, the, the flag of uh, la Via Campesina. Hay una propuesta de hacer una foto con todos los participantes aquí eh, et los, euh, las personas del público cerca de la bandera de la Via Campesina. Comment manger euh, cette, euh, des légumes aussi.